Welcome to the Theory of DFS podcast. I'm Jordan Cooper, aka Blender at Blender HD, the co-author of the Theory of Daily Fantasy Sports. It's a 15-hour audio DFS masterclass. You can find a theory of DFS.com. Join with me this week. Uh, I, 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 it's hard to say that you're a newcomer. You're at least you're a new monster. I, I'm, well, us, I'm using Brick 75's <laughs> terms. A new monster in the the DFS. Uh, contests uh, in in all sports, and uh, and a, a regular in uh, in in you wake up at eleven o'clock in the morning and you're o- you seem to be always in the in the the pregame show and Roto Grinders the chat. Uh, but uh, you're you're a ve- you're a very good player and uh, I almost feel like, like I don't know why you the, you you're there to maybe help me out answering questions in the chat that I'm not answering. Uh, but uh, it's a uh, Daniel Hutchings nerdy tenor. And uh, you, I, you're nerdy tenor on Twitter, but you don't. You, apparently, you don't. You, you really don't even use Twitter. Yeah, I just created that account because I figured I should have one, but <laughs> I've been too lazy to post anything there. Um, but yeah, I am, I am kind of new. I mean, I've only been playing any kind of real volume since 2019. Um, we can we can get into the background. I'm another poker refugee like you. Um, I. Some people know this, but um, I I wrote uh, Pro Poker Tools is my product, so it's an equity calculator for poker. Um, so I was very much involved with poker software for a while. And uh, how, how long per- back for the poker? I mean, were you were you back when way back when the HUDs first started coming out? Yeah. So my first my first web version of my software came out in like 2006 or so. And then uh, made a downloadable product in 2011, 2012, something like that. And uh, yeah, I, um, I've also done custom stuff. I've worked, I've coached some professional players with my software and that kind of stuff. But uh, mostly, I'm a software guy. I'm not a sports guy at all. I mean, you joke about how you like, you you just have names, numbers in a spreadsheet, but you actually that's a little. You're kind of exaggerating things a little bit, but in uh, in my case, that's actually true. Um, I could not pick out these people in a lineup uh, uh, if you paid me. So uh, it's right. It's... I, I exaggerated a bit because, like, I I've I followed sports in general for most of my life. I mean, this did. I mean, I played fantasy season long, and I may I may have a fifteen year gap of when I like followed the major sports in between. So, like, when I came back into DFS, the only sport I only followed was like soccer. So like yeah. I need to I need to learn who the new bat you know like you know when I was watching basketball like Shaq was like young and Kevin Garnett was a rookie like so when I say that I I don't know sports it you're right it is a little bit more of of an exaggeration but still in playing DFS I'm not sitting there going you know this guy's good and that guy's bad like right I, mean, like, I had to approach it from a I'd. I'm gonna play baseball, and I know I know the, the the basics of baseball. I umpired baseball. I I I could look at all these stats. I remember the Bill James's books or anything. And then you, you drill it down, and you realize that most of the stuff that people think matters doesn't, and anything else is quantifiable. And then you start taking the names off of these players, and like oh, like oh, this is just this is just pretty much all math, and like watching the games is not all that important. Yeah, I'm trying to remember when I first came across you, but you were the first person I found where I was like, oh, this guy's actually speaking my language because I I found a lot of these sort of, because my background is all numbers, right? It's all simulations and solvers and this kind of stuff. And I first, I first started writing just sort of as a fun hobby. I, I was a little burnt out on poker software, so... In 2018, I started looking at the simplest game I could find, which was NFL Tears on DraftKings, which is dead simple. It's so simple that you can actually, you can generate all possible lineups. There's only, there's usually, I don't know, 50,000 possible combinations total. And then I'm like, can I build something automated that can win at some contests? And they sort of toyed around with that and got something to work for very very low limit contests um because those games are so so ridiculously soft so so hold on how did you get into if you're not a sports person 
Like, how did you get into DFS? I know there's a lot of people that came from poke, like early DFS. It was a lot of poker people because it's very yeah. similar concepts and people that were playing poker online are like, well, there's this other game that has an edge. So like a lot of poker people also play chess or backgammon or, you know, like I, I played gin rummy against the Italian guys at the poker club. Like I'm, I, I think I have a little bit more old school type of gambling background. Like I played mostly live poker and yeah. online poker, yes, I dabble. I mean, I learned I learned the mechanics. I played limit. I was playing one two limit uh, poker stars. That's how huh? I learned how to play, like two thousand two, two thousand three. But yeah, I, I've been in some of those games with you. It's entirely possible. <laughs> and I read yeah. the two plus two forums. But to me, yep. when HUDs, when the software that you made, when Poker Tracker started coming out, and you were able to import all your hand histories, and then you were able to have the 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 uh, the heads up display. To me, that's 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 almost what killed online poker because like the sharp players just like it you they destroyed the bad player. I mean, like it's 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 too especially when you have all the harvesting of the data because you could just be at tables and publicly get all the information and like you have all this this dossiers on players. Like my my strength in live poker was that my strength uh -huh. in live poker was. I, as long as I love playing long sessions with similar people and it's like, I'll start, I'll start at a full table. And as long as you play with me long enough, like, like I'll, I'll get your ranges down. Like this, like it, it, it's it becomes so obvious. It becomes like, there's no way this guy has this hand on this spot and like fold. There's no way this guy, like, this is either, this is a completely, you know, uh, you know, it, it's nuts or nothing, right? It's the completely polarized rant. So it's like, sometimes, yeah, I call, with my bottom pair, and then they show me like a straight flush, and I go, okay, I guess I was wrong there, but they'll sometimes show me jack high. Like, but once online, like that was the predominant, like, like my advantage, like even online was that of like, I wanna play against the same people for a long enough time because no one is having a notebook and taking all these notes and, and noticing all these patterns that once kind of like the HUDs came, it's like, oh, now, now I could just put a number to that and. Now I'm playing against all the people that also have the same numbers, and like yeah. to me that to me that's that's where DFS eventually goes. I it, yeah. I think it takes much longer than it does for online poker, uh, but but like how did how did you get into if you're not a sports person like that jump a lot of times even the poker people were at least people that maybe like like degenerate gambling on on sports like they followed they were sports people in general it would be on TV when you're at the, you know, card room or something like you, did you just view this as like, Oh, here's another game that I could build a piece of software for. Well, it's a little bit of both. So uh, it, that's part of it. But um, one of my professional poker playing colleagues was like, let's meet. This was, this was a while ago in 2015. He's like, we had done a poker project together, which was very successful. And then he's like, this DFS thing is starting is really something we should, we should look at it. Do we want to do we want to attack it? So I met with him and another uh, software engineer I respect, and a couple other people to talk it over. And what's funny is I ended up taking a pass on that project because I had I had too much other stuff I wanted to do. Um, and then they proceeded to do stuff. I I don't think what they were doing actually got anywhere, but that's sort of. <laughs> Very what were they doing? Can you can you explain? Like back in 2015, what were they what were they doing? They were, were they trying to do things like I mean, they were trying to do things like analyze uh, sentiment around football games and generate lineups, like automated tools for figuring out what the field's going to do. Basically, like early version of what we have now with ownership projections and stuff, and using that to make good lineups. Um, I but I didn't participate in that, but that sort of planted the seed in the back of my head. So. I just I just dabbled a little bit. I'm like, huh, maybe maybe there's something here. I'll just play around and I try something and I put it down for a while. And then what happened was in 2019, I started to look at NFL Showdown. And, and you must have, you must have saw how big of an edge with the the duplication that yeah, you could build well, so such lineups with such positive expected value. Of course, it'll take God knows how long for you to realize that. Well, that you I, had to have noticed that you download the CSVs and you're like, there's so many deadline ups in these contests. Well, see, I never did it that way. I sort of discovered it 
so I my general approach, and this is the approach I've taken with poker software too, is to try to write software so that the program figures things out and then I try to learn from the software. So basically I created a system that would generate entries for these showdown contests. And I would enter for a while, I'd enter one entry just so that I could have the CSV after the contest was over. And then I could analyze how my software was doing on average because my software would generate like a thousand lineups it liked. And I'd say, well, what's the average EV of those thousand lineups? And they were just crushing. I mean, it was just ridiculous um, over many contests. Some contests it would get killed, of course, when, you know, the chalk smashes and there's eight million ties for first. But the average was very compelling. So in 2019, I contacted somebody who I knew had quite a big bankroll and I had him stake me in these contests. Um, so in 2019, I played a bunch of showdown and we basically broke even. Okay, so we're like, oh, let's try it again next season. And then in 2020, during the pandemic, I hit a showdown, a million dollar Monday night showdown. And there was only one other person with the same lineup. So that's like that's like seven hundred thousand dollars. One hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Oh, yeah, because it's a million to first, a hundred thousand a second. <laughs> second. <laughs> oh, that's uh, I hate those fucking. But I'm, but I'm, but yeah, but to, to be fair. The showdowns are the ones, the only contests where I literally don't care about anything other than first. Pl like, like that gap, like in, in classic slates, I hate the hundred thousand, 25,000, 10,000. I'd rather it be 50, 40, 30, 20. You, I want to get some, like if I come in eighth place, like I, I'm, I'm still not losing money long run, but in the showdowns, I don't care because I'm the whole goal is to get a solo or a you more unique duplicated two, three, four, under five times and yeah. win at the top. Like if I come in sixth place, I don't like, like you're losing money in the long run unless you're coming, unless you get that nut lineup, like yeah. you're, you're, you're losing like, so you're, it's not a sustainability. You, I know that that's what the variance is going to be. The classic, I don't want that same amount of variance every slate also. So yeah. li like you, like you said, like, so, so was that the, was that the, the, like the, why don't go up in your head? It's like now that I have uh, a half a million dollars, like uh, n now you now you have the bankroll to kind of like double, triple down, add sports, and kind of like develop stuff from there. That's it. Yeah. So you know, my backer was putting up all the money and taking all the risk, so he got most of it, but I still got a big chunk, and that was enough of a bankroll to get started. So in the middle of the pandemic. Po you know, a lot of my poker colleagues, you know, they couldn't play live poker. Some of them play online, but I, a lot of that stuff was slowing down and I needed a break from that again. So I started looking at golf and I did the same process. I would enter one time and then I'd hone my system and then I would constantly back test and see, you know, given the projections that I had at the time, you know, how would the system have done versus the opponents I was facing? And that's just the constant iteration, the constant cycle. It's like, try something out, back test it, you know, hone, rinse, repeat. Can, can um, I ask you why? Okay. Cause uh, here, here's the thing that I would ask, and this is coming from like, if come from the back, come from my mentality of if there is an edge, I want to take advantage of it as quickly as possible. Now mm. I understand why you entered, you're, you're entering just for information and then you're running it separately. You're basically running the contest separately going, if I would have entered 150 lineups, this is what would have ended up happening. What, why weren't you, you could have done that for the main GPP. Why weren't you just building 150 for like the quarter arcade or some low I, stakes? It, it, Cause I'm just assuming that you're doing it because you don't want to invest, you know, you know, if it's actually like a $15 entry, 150 lineups, that's 27 50, you know, like, like, but in the quarter, the dot, you know, the quarter contest dollar, what low stakes, like why not do both? Why not? Okay. I'll do that. But also just I'll run it and get my best 150 and put it in the quarter. It's a, it's a, maybe I'll make, and I'll maybe you'll, maybe you'll make some money, not as much money, obviously, but also you're playing against weaker opponents typically. So like you get more, you're at least taking advantage. If there is an edge, you have some upside and you don't have to risk as much was, was just, you come from such a programmer type of mentality that you're like, I don't want to, I don't want to put in the money until I know that, I, that I'm right. 
I think it's that. It's a little bit of my inner nit coming out. Um, but also... You can't call yourself... You really... I see the volume you play now. You're not a nit. So by the time I got to MLB, so so I did golf for a while. And golf, the irony there is I had a lot of success with golf in 2020, both in real returns and in my simulated returns. But now that I have a much larger, larger data set, I'm not convinced I have much of an edge at all <laughs> in golf. Well, and I, I, I've I, said that before. I mean, uh, if... if from what from what I've looked at, and because I played golf, I played PGA for like maybe two years. Yeah. From what I looked at, what whenever whenever the the whenever you back test, and the number one variable that predicts success is ownership, it's then like song. it's hard it's hard for me to convince myself that that there's an edge there because that's in all the other sports that's nowhere near the highest correlative, you yeah. know, metric to. To, to can you predict the predictive power of ownership is like way down on the list. Maybe in some, maybe in football for like certain positions, but it's still nowhere near like, like, like anything else. So in golf, like, is, is that the realization that you may, and if that's the case, why the hell do people play PGA? Well, <laughs> so I'm not sure if I have enough data yet. I think the lifetime simulated result I have for all my golf stuff is around plus 5%, plus 4%, but it's very skewed because it's highly positive in 2020, and then it's basically slightly negative in 2021. So I don't know what to make of it. I don't know if I just don't have enough data yet. I mean, the, the variance in these things is so enormous, even when you do the thing that I do, which is I'm not even analyzing the 150 lineups I would have played. I'm analyzing like, in the case of golf, there's often like 20,000 candidates that my software will generate, and I just pick 150 at random. So I'm already reducing variance by doing that, by taking the average of the 20,000 and not just the 150 I entered. But even when you do that, the variance is just, it's amazing. And, and for golf, it's like you said, I mean, if you use your three levers, you basically, there's no correlation. The projections in the Vegas lines are extremely efficient. So the only lever you have left is ownership. And and it's the most correlative lever. Right? Yeah. So I'm not sure if it's enough to beat. It's enough to beat the field, but I'm not convinced it's enough to beat to win money after the rake. I, I did an analysis of every golf CSV, um, every contest I've ever played on DraftKings. And I looked at the top 30 players by dollar volume entered. Um, and it's just the contest I'm playing, but it's most of the main contest, including the showdowns, the round threes, the captains, the main, all of that stuff. And the top 30 players ROI was like 1%. 1% over that whole... Well, if they're putting in enough volume, 1% maybe it's... But it's divided 30 ways and it has enormous variance, right? So I, I'm not... It's hard to know what to make of that. But MLB, I, I lost my knit. So by the time I got to MLB, which is the last sport I've, been, I've done, I'm like, I have good evidence that my methods in general are working. So I'm just going to, as soon as I have something that looks decent, I'm just going to start cramming in volume. So, But you also you were also playing the NBA showdown yeah. stuff. Because I, I, lo I look at your Roto-Grinders profile, and of course, you know, you when you come in first tied, you know, 74 ways, they'd still give you the number, the, the number yeah. of points as if you, if you won the whole thing. Uh, yeah. uh, the problem, the problem with the, the showdown stuff is that like, from what I, from what I gather in, in the show, now, the way that I play showdown or M, I view MMA very similarly. Yeah. Where it's, it's very based on removing dupes and playing yeah. lineups that have that less people are playing. Uh, mm -hmm. that when you're playing a lot, like I've heard, I've heard two, there's, to me, there's two lines of thought amongst sharp players that if you're going to play 150 lineups at whatever amount of lineups that you're trying to mix high lineups that may not be the highest EV, but have a higher probability of retaining equity in the contest 
versus playing 150 straight. Like, I could play 150 uniques in MMA, but I can tell you that 75 of them are the are the highest standard deviation lineups that, like, they have very little chance. They leave 4,000 on the table. It, it, it'll it happen once in a blue moon, but, like, the likelihood of me getting zero back on that is, like, 99% of the time. So, even though they're plus EV, if I'm if, if, if it's a $20 contest in MMA and I'm playing 150 lineups and I play $3,000 worth of those lineups, mm-hmm. like... If I don't hit on any of them, like it's going to, I'm going to get back 300 bucks. I mean, like, like I'm going to get back almost nothing. And yeah, if I have a, if I have a $10 million bankroll, like probably I could keep on doing that. That's no problem. But like, I don't believe I have the bankroll size to withstand that amount of variance that when you play 150 limbs, are you more on the side of, I'm just going to play the highest EV lineups, no matter what type of side of the spectrum, or are you on more of the side of the spectrum of I'm, my goal is to find the optimal lineup for NBA showdown. And if it just so happens to be uh, duplicated 90 times, then I probably, I probably end up losing money on that slate. Like you could win first place and lose money. I've Uh, done it. Right. 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 So it looks good, but it's not profitable long-term at all. But right. the fact that you have some of those lineups in your pool means yeah. that you must you must be weighing something where it's like I don't I I don't want to just have the the 150 highest variance lineups and then possibly go on a three four week stretch that like it it's unlikely to happen and then next thing you know you're down you're down 150 thousand dollars when you could have at least had some of your lineups that. Placed first and tied a couple of ways, and you got seven thousand back, even right. though you didn't win the hundred thousand. Like, are, yeah, so are, it seems like you're more on that side. That's correct, and I'll tell you why and how it how it. So that kind of happens naturally, um, automatically by the way my software works. So, for it's this is also related to the difference between playing an exploitative or exploitive style of play and playing a more balanced style of play. Um, and I think it's very much the same analogy with poker. There, there's basically two ways you win money at poker. The first is you just play the right range of hands with the right frequencies, and you don't play your seven-deuce offsuit under the gun, and then you wait for your opponent to screw it up. The other way is you notice that your opponent always check-raises the flop with a flush draw, and you punish him, uh, by putting in a second bet on the turn when it doesn't come, right? This is the exploit versus right. balance. You're, you're speaking that. my language because I, when I played poker, I was more of the I was more of the exploitative type right. than like I could play balanced. It's just boring. It's just like I typically would play balanced in the wild games, like um, games that were that, that were going to be high variance. People are 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 it's six way raised pots because everyone wants action. It's like I'm just going to play my multi way hands. And wait to hit the nuts, and I'm going to get paid off because everyone pays everyone off on this table. So to me, all I have to do is just play good hands and value bet, and and you're done. It was those weak tight tables where it's just like I could just like like dude, I know what everyone has. I mean, I know the range of everyone's hand here, and it's like you know I'm going to get I'll, I'll be able to get a free card here. I'm going to be able to check raise this guy off of this hand. He's not going to call me with top pair weak kicker. I know he's going to he's going to bet here for that and ha- and I would say 80% of the time he has this hand and I'm sitting here with a, a, a gut shot draw only and I check raise and win the hand and then sometimes I check raise and get called and I make the hand and then I get paid off and uh, like to me like it do, do I come across especially with the way that I, I I teach and play DFS that probably in poker you figured that I was more of a that I all of my mentality is based around like what everyone else is going to do not like not keeping any type of strategy just to myself, yeah, like in I one think, way. I think for most people playing DFS and winning, I suspect that's what they're doing. I think, I think more winning players are like you. I'm, I'm a balanced guy, so. No, I thought. No, I think you're wrong. No. No, I think I think most top players are your style. 
Oh, really? I mean, That's if you just take a look, take a look. I mean, download the CSVs and take a look at the lineup. Take, I mean, take a look at Osimo's lineups and and Brick 75's lineups and whist like something like Whistles Go Woo. Like, I mean, he's even said that like he barely ever considers ownership at all. Uh, like, right? Like, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of players that like they have their own projections, they have their own simulations, and they're like, I'm gonna play. I'm gonna play the 150 best lineups that I think in some diversified methodology so they don't you know they, they, they reduce the amount of variance but they're not yeah yeah they're considering ownership because that goes into the simulations but they're not specifically like going out of their way to like start their pro they like the process doesn't start with who like they don't think in terms of relative value well i do like well uh, to me i i view the lineups and it probably could be proven by math and like i i'm saying the word probably because i I can't make that type of system where we have a slate, for instance, uh, like where a pitcher is going to be 50% owned and it's like the stack versus the stack or ba any batters versus that pitcher are actually more valuable than the similarly owned batters with the same projection against pitchers that are going to be 1% owned because the better that those batters do, the worse that 50% of the lineups do. But I just... I don't be, I don't believe many top players take that much into account. Maybe maybe I'm over maybe maybe I'm the one that's wrong and is overvaluing that type of stuff. No, I think you're onto something, but I, I've never really talked to anybody except you about any of this stuff. So I'll just back up and tell you what, what my software tries to do is and you and you and Eric have like danced around this on, on this show several times and I'm like, that's what I'm trying to do with your discret so my software tries to, it assumes basically that all the players in the slate have the same projection systems and are trying to maximize their EV. And then basically, I simulate what actual players would enter into a contest and have them compete against each other. So it's I'm simulating the, the fantasy point production of all the athletes but I'm also simulating the lineups that people would actually enter into the slate. And then over time, I'm adjusting what that mix of lineups is because assuming everybody is trying to exploit everybody else. So it's very similar to what like a poker solver does. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end, what you get is you get a mix of lineups of all different kinds that are played with different frequencies. So what I basically, and the long and short of it is, is I'm trying to compute efficient ownership at the level of lineups, right? right. And then I just play whatever that is. And the thing about that is, um, if the pirates are, if I compute correctly, that the pirates stack is supposed to be 10% owned today, and I play it at 10%, if the field does something different, I win money, and it doesn't even matter which way it is. If they play it 20%, that means it's over-owned, and my Pirates lineups are now less valuable, but I'm playing them less often than everyone else. So I'm saving money by only playing at 10% instead of 20%. But if the field plays at 5%, it's under-owned, and now I have twice as many Pirates lineups as the field, and they're twice as profitable, because it should have been 10% owned, the field only has five percent. Does that does that make but, sense? But wouldn't optimally, wouldn't you, if a if a stack, or a lineup or whatever combination is over, isn't there a point where it's over and owned enough that there would be those ten like when you play those ten pirate lineups, and you you you'd say that the efficient ownership of the pirates or whatever we could say an individual player it could be whatever whatever it is, because uh, obviously there's different pirate stacks right because there's different sure. right but just we're just using just the bulk uh, right. I you you believe you your accuracy your software your model your everything says the pirates should be efficiently ten percent owned today. They're gonna be twenty percent owned. So does that mean that out of hundred and fifty lineups that there are ten you're gonna play ten pirates lineups? But really, aren't there ten other lineups that are more profitable than just the yeah. pirates? That if you knew that they were over owned, you wouldn't be playing them at all. That's exactly right. So again, the analogy of with poker is pretty perfect like if you play a balanced strategy against your opponents their mistakes will win you money 
But if you exploit their mistakes, you'll make a lot, you can make a lot more, right? So yes, if I know a priori that people are actually going to play pirates at 20%, I can make more money just not playing them at all. That's right. Right. But, but so, I can but, 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 money just playing them 10%. Because even though those will lose money, I will necessarily have more money in under-owned lineups. <laughs> which but, do you, is what but, but don't you have, to, wouldn't you build the lineups differently though? Because you, because well, we're, we're using the term pirate stacks, but there's obviously two pitchers and three other batters in the lineup, and my my whole methodology is based around the full, like the relative value of the entire lineup. So if the pirates are over owned, like if you play a pirates lineup with, you know, a, and if it, if you play an efficient, let's say you're building a you know a combination, you know you build an efficient pirates with the efficient giants and two efficient pitchers. Like that would be the baseline of zero of, of, of like that lineup is neither profitable or unprofitable. It's just like, it's almost a waste. It's almost like, it's just like, that's just there. Like it, it, it's a perfect frequency of everything. Now, once it goes off, like if, if the pirates are over owned, but the giants are efficiently owned, the better lineup would be a lineup that is under owned. So the three man stack would be, now you want to, instead you want you don't want to play efficiently owned or over owned. You never really want to play over owned teams together. But like, if you're going to make these four, fours, five, threes, whatever site you're on, wouldn't depending on where your frequency is compared to the ownership change the, like you could still play pirates. Like if the pirates are, for instance, we, we, the ultimate exploit would be to just not play the pirates in that case. Like the pirates five man stack is twice as owned as it should be. I'm just going to play zero pirates lineups. But maybe but, they're the they, they still have high equity, but you now because you know that they're overowned, it's like to balance that out. So I get a higher expected value. I I make sure to play the one percent owned whatever with them to balance that frequency out because this underowned one percent this team that's going to be owned at one percent should be owned at three percent, right? So that's an inefficiency. So you'd rather have that in that lineup. So do you like? To me, this is to me. This is the game. This is this is this is how I play, yeah. And I try to build into into the optimizers to make those types of like I could play an overowned team, the Padres and cores, overowned, uh, but they still project the best. So like, if I had a choice between not playing them or playing them, it's gonna be not playing them. I think they're overowned. Right. But right. since but if I don't play, I, I'm gonna have 150 lineups without the top projected stack. Like I could just play these lineups. Just don't play the the hot the overowned pitcher and the overowned one offs in that lineup. And now at least I'm not at least out of the 150 lineups. It may not be the top EV lineup, but it's not going to be a lineup that I really shouldn't even be playing in my 150 set to begin with. Right. No, I totally agree. And if I were hand building lineups, I would definitely use that methodology. And it, it occurs to me that what you're describing is almost like a sub game within the game. Like this, the sub game of picking pirates lineups, right? right? And you, even though pirates lineups as a whole may be overowned, you may be able to get sufficient leverage within the sub game of I want to play a pirate stack that it's still profitable in your contest. Sure, yeah, but but it seems like you you don't fo you don't focus on that, or a lot of top players don't focus on that. Is the reason okay? Can I ask? Is the reason? Yeah. Is the reason that it's extra work and it's already profitable without doing that? Yeah, I mean, so what I do is it, at a high level, it's very, very simple. So, so you talk about higher EV lineups, but what, what's really confusing and a little counterintuitive is that the the process I use has basically all these effectively intelligent agents trying to exploit each other until they can't exploit each other anymore. And so because of that, the software considers all of the lineups to have the same EV. They're all equally good. It's just like how you talk about on the morning show about you could have a super chalky lineup that has a similar EV to an extremely wacky lineup because the wacky one occasionally wins first. But the super chalky one very rarely wins first, but wins a lot of 10th and 12th and 40th. Right. And that the sum is the same. So that's that's what how my software works as well. So 
it says these i it just keeps crunching and crunching and crunching until it can't tell the difference in ev between any of the lineups anymore and it says i'm done pick pick which ones you want right and then um, and then and then it's counterintuitive and it's very similar to when like on a lot of shows that i say like dude you could probably been build thousands of lineups that are close in ev right because i'm not i'm not i'm i don't have your 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 software i don't program like you do but I'm typically directionally accurate where I could look at, I could look at 500 to a thousand lineups and go, these all seem about the same. Like they all project in some range. They're owned in some range that, and they're, it, it, some of them are six V sixes. And then you tell people it's like, and they're like, well, which one should I play? And I go, it, it doesn't matter which one you play. Yeah. And then their head explodes and they go, how does it mean? What do you mean? It doesn't matter. And it's like, well, and they'll go, I, 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 I'll, I would need to play 20 lineups. So do I play 20 of the same team or 20? like all you're doing is describing like your, your, the variance of a single slate. And yeah. if you had a choice between like, obviously if we played this out over the course of your DFS career or a million, a million slates, it wouldn't matter which 20 you choose. But if you, you, you have a finite life and a finite bankroll that in the choice, if you have to pick 20 lineups, but to, out of 5,000, having the most diversity, you know, at least saves you from, you know, putting in a hundred and losing a zero. And like, you're more likely to, you know, your, your bad days are, you're losing 50% and not all of it. And, right. but also on your good days, like if you're not diverse, like you could come in first, second, third, fourth. I mean, like you could take half the prize pool, but that's, yeah. but it's counterintuitive to tell people that, that lineups that are like six V sixes and eight V eights of each other, have the same expected value. And then, then the natural instinct for people that may not, you know, grasp the math, like that nonlinear thinking is that then it, it all seems like a raffle. Like it's like, and that, that, right. and that's how I view golf of like, I, I feel, I feel like I can, I can, I can make that. I look at the top players lineups. And I think just like you said, with the lack of edge that you've seen with the 1% ROI, it's like, oh, there's 50,000 lineups that are all about the same expected value. And it just comes down to which 150 did I play today versus someone else's 150. But they're all that's so then it just it just feels like a lot or it just feels like a rat. As long as long as you have 150 out of those sets of lineups, it just comes down to which which ones which which ones comes comes in on that specific slate. And then you just right. do it all again the next week. Yeah, it's interesting. I've, I've spent a fair amount of time digging into like figuring out where where the edge comes from and also what looking at CSVs and figuring out where the bad lineups are coming from and what they're doing. So where, um, do, where do the bad lineups come? Is is there is there is there a, is there a place where the bad lineups come from? <laughs> <laughs> is there is there a, like a lineup like goblin heaven hell type of place that But what when, when, when when you say that you're looking for where the bad lineups come from, you're talking about like usernames. Yeah, like, well, just like, what are they doing? Like, and who are, who are, like, where's the edge coming from? It, it's it's easy to spend a lot of time thinking about, like, how to make good lineups. And, and um, but it's also worth looking about what, looking carefully at what people are doing wrong. And it seems like when you get rid of the obvious things, like rostering players who aren't going to play and not entering your reserved entry, which I've done, by the way. Um, <laughs> so, everyone has at some point I've never done that $800 mistake I also I also had had a CSV tilt a couple times where uh, one time I, I I just didn't save to the correct file right and so I had a golf lineup filled a, a round three golf lineup placeholder filled with golfers who had already been cut that was embarrassing <laughs> well that's well that's that's why I suggest if you're going to make a dummy lineup Make a yeah, dummy no. lineup with that. Let that at least is is like make make a make a fifty fifty double up cash. Make yeah, something. I, I I changed my process after that happened, but uh, but you said so you you so you studied the bad lineups. Yeah. So and and like what are they doing? And so I looked at golf in particular. It so if you look at the bottom third, I think it was. A, I'm making up the numbers a little. The bottom third of entries by volume by dollar volume. And so these are people who so, put in a grand total of like 
a few hundred bucks, right? Uh, uh, so we're not even talking about like single bullet guys. No, yeah, these are people who like entered a, a few times, five dollars here, twenty dollars there. Their ROI in the golf contests I look at as a group was something like minus thirty three percent. So they're losing. I don't know, the average of 12 to 15 percent of rake and then another 12 to 15 percent um, by not having good lineups. And my initial rough analysis was it was all about clustered ownership like that dominated their return, that their lost return is that they all I just imagine somebody sitting down and sort of throwing together a lineup by hand based on players he's heard of and players he likes and maybe somebody on the TV and you just get so many people doing the same process. They all wind up with stuff that's almost exactly the same or so close. It, that, is, isn't that, isn't that what I, what I call the, the min cat, like it. So, so in, in your analysis, you would agree with me that the, the, when I say dead money, I'm talking about the lineups where like you're essentially playing a cash you're playing more of a a double up a, a lineup that is geared more towards winning in the 55th to 60th percentile rather than lineups that take down you know top 1 percentile top 5th percentile outcomes often enough that the rate that everything you just get bled away yeah so no, that, that's, that so that's kind of what we're talking so we're talking about the oh. lineups where in golf they're playing the 30% owned guy with the 20% owned guy with the 15% owned guy with the 20% owned value play. like and they, maybe they're off but maybe they have one guy that's 8% owned or something like that but it like that that amount of leverage in the lineup is not making up for the fact that like a third of the lineups in the contest almost look like these yeah, and it's, it's they have no consideration for ownership whatsoever. There's this funny thought experiment where like it's it sounds stupid, but like if you go to the grocery store, the time you go to the grocery store, it, the most likely time that you go to the grocery store is when it's most crowded. Because you're a person and by definition it's most crowded when the most people are there. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like it's the same effect. If you just kind of hand build a lineup with with no concern for ownership, there's going to be a thousand other people doing something almost exactly the same as you, because none of us are that special, right? <laughs> so, right. But also, you know. also that comes into account where you read content, you listen to shows, and even just bare basic median projections. I mean, there's like, oh, these are the best point per dollar plays. I'm going to jam them in. I I listened to three shows, and they all said they like this guy, that guy, and that guy. It's like, yeah. Because they're the highest projected guys and they have the better win odds compared to their salaries because the DraftKings salaries are inefficient. And they go, well, I'm just going to put all six. And they, and that's, to me, that's the edge in DFS of like, your job is not, is the, the, the macro concept of your, your job isn't to build the most probable lineup. It's to build the most profitable lineup. Yeah. I, I think it's very hard it can be very hard to see what's happening too, and especially if you're playing in GPPs, because the variance is so high. You you can't it. I mean, you always uh, reinforcing the need to look at what good players do, and I think that's very good advice because if you just look at a few slates and who won, it tells you very little. Um, it tells you something. I mean, a lot of times not, on a one slate. Like you could be like, well, I thought this team was under on this team, like on baseball, like you could go like, uh, or even it's more like NFL, like with certain like running backs and wide receiver, like specific players and go, well, if I look at these 20 players and I, I played a lot of this guy cause I thought he was under owned for a ceiling. And you see out of these 20 players, 18 out of the 20 were significantly over the field and the number of lineups they were playing them in. I can at least go, okay, my process of figuring out like that efficient ownership compared to these players was like, was, was good. But if like, I'm playing, if, if I'm playing, you know, 20% Marlin stacks, because I think they're the third highest ceiling on the slate and no one's playing them. And I look at my lineups and I have 25% Marlins and all these sharp, uh, 20 sharp players, like half of them have 0% and the other half have like one lineup. And it's like, well, like most likely you were wrong, right? right you, yeah. you could, I mean, you could see kind of the obvious things, but I think you're talking about the, 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 
the construction kind of EV. That's why you have to look at the individual liners. When I go through results DB for the pregame show, there's only so much I could do by looking at one slate. It's a matter of downloading the CSVs and analyzing a certain player and then looking at their lineups for 50 slates, for 100 slates, and go, what what are the things that they do differently from other players? And that's why you could get the the, the guys, you could get the RBX 88s, which, just like like what Brian would say on, on LOLs, uh, I have no fucking clue what he does. Like, mm-hmm. like he, he's, he's one of those guys where I know it's going to be weird and I can't predict what weird way it's going to be, but it's never, it's never what I think it's going to be. And then you have guys like Ricky D, which are like, now he, he basically, he's, he's going to, he does more of the exploited type of thing of he's going to find the three most under, based on his process, the three most like under owned highest EV. And it's just like, I'm going to build all my lineups around that and make sure I have the combinations. And then when I win, I win big. And when I don't, I don't. But like you, you can't necessarily see that because on some slates, Rick, Rick has a more balanced strategy. Some, but over the course of studying him for a year, two years, three years, you get a sense of like what people are more likely doing than not. That's why I could look at your lineups and go, I know that you play, you play in, in the, in the showdown stuff. Like the fact that you're, you're, you're playing lineups that tie, uh, 94 ways like I know you're not playing the exploitive strategy because like I would predict I, I would never play that lineup to begin with so you yeah. must be more on that side than I am so but I wouldn't be able to tell from one slate like from one slate hey maybe it was a mistake I make I, I played showdown and have and have the lineup that's duplicated 128 times also and a lot of times it's just a fucking mistake it's just a mistake sure. I mean my I will say you know my software is far from perfect. Like, there's a lot of simplifying assumptions. It's it's complicated. I have to, like, for MLB, I have to generate a ton of lineups. Like, I usually make like a million different lineups. How long does it um, take to make a million lineups? A few seconds. But <laughs> not, see, not, this is I, this I, is how much better you are as a programmer than I am. <laughs> oh, it sounds more impressive than it is. I haven't even gotten to the point of evaluating whether they're any good or not. This is just like a big pool of all sorts of different kinds of lineups that might be good. And then I have to simulate all of the baseball player results, right? Using projections and simulations, all of that. Right. But and, and then, also just, just to highlight it, you don't build your own projections. No, I do not build my own projections. Right. So you're using, I, you're using projections that are publicly available in the industry. That can be paid for. Yes. Right. And um, then I need to race all these lineups against each other and simulate people deciding which lineups on, Hey, Oh, this time I ran the slate and this lineup won. So now people are more likely to pick that lineup. And then the next time that ties five ways. So the EV of that lineup goes down and this other thing goes up and you do that, you know, half a million times and then you get something I can use, but it's far from perfect. And, I know for a fact that if, if you go through results DB and look at some of the stuff I've made, you will find like objectively bad lineups in there. You're like, this lineup just kind of sucks. Yeah, it does. <laughs> I know <laughs> there are, but if, if the average lineup is plus EV, I'm okay. And then, you know, over time, hopefully I get fewer and fewer bad lineups in there. You know, right. that, over- That's what happens to me all the time building that's all I run out of time. I just run out of, also, I don't have, I don't have a process like you, like you have, I mean, like my, my, I, I'm, I'm a web 1.0 web developer. So like, like you should see some of my web stuff. I still haven't updated it, <laughs> but I'm saying Rocket. like, I, I never learned, I never learned programming languages that are built around like the closest thing that I would be able to build. If this was 20 years ago, I, I, I don't, re- I don't remember most of it is Perl. Uh-huh. And if you imagine right if you wrote this in Perl, it would be it would be like so no. inefficient and st- it would take forever. I mean, like it would be stupid. Uh, but I mean, that's all I knew. Perl, JavaScript, HTML, CSS. It was all front end web design. Some some, you know, MySQL, then PHP came like so it's not yeah. built around doing any of these types. I would never I would for a website, you'd never have to do any of this like this. Right. Yeah. No, what I I mean, I I'm. At heart, I'm an engineer. You know, there's the old saw about programmers or like mushrooms. You put them in a dark room, 
you shovel shit on it and it prospers. <laughs> so I'm sort of in that mold. You know, I just kind of like to just grind away, making things faster and more efficient. So that's that's really my wheelhouse is is making code that that computes stuff quickly. And um, but it it's, takes a long time. I mean, it's a lot of work. I um I'm sort of torn about how much to reveal, but about my process, but I talked more and more about it just after I realized that, you know, it's really, it's really hard to do all of the things I've done. Like it took a long time to get something that I was happy with. And if you're good enough to do that, you probably don't need my help anyway. <laughs> so right. I mean, right. I don't, I don't think anything that you've said so far like is, is nothing other than obvious or things that you could, it's just a matter of, can you execute it well? Yeah. And if you don't know, and if you don't know the basics of how to do any, like, like me, I, I'm, I, I'm not going to be able to do what you do. I, well, I, I don't have the programming, but I would have to, I would have to learn that. And I, I, to me, I, I rely on the fact that like, I think I grasp the concepts extremely well and yeah. can build directionally accurate enough for the ecosystem, the way it is now in DFS to still be, to, to still be profitable and still be on a large amount of the same plus CV type of lineups as someone like you, but yeah. I'm also going to have also the, the, you know, if I play a hundred lineups, also I'm not playing 150 lineups, so I'm not compounding. Like when you have an edge, you want it to compound me. I can't quantify that. So I don't feel comfortable 150 ing every slate on every site and everything. Cause like I'm being directionally accurate so I may have some slates where if I play 150 lineups, I may have 50 bad lineups. Well, some sure, slates I may I, have five bad lineups, but like, it's not, it's not like, I can't be confident enough to push that edge so much, but, sure, no, but I, I know that my top, my top 20 to 40, like I know I could, I know I could exploit 50 lineups in a large field contest. I know I could, if I'm building one lineup, I know it's like, okay, that's why you tell people like, oh, I'm, can you play one lineup into 150 uh, max, you know, large field contest. I go, absolutely. And you know what you should do? You should see who the chalk is in X amount, right? If, if you only have one, don't worry. There's no diversification. Play the highest EV lineup you can, if, especially if the money is like, if it's disposable. Uh-oh. Picture went out. Yeah. You're back. I mean, sorry, somebody tried to call me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, I think, so... But, but do you think, because like, people will listen to a lot of these episodes where I bring someone on that, that does a lot of, a lot, a lot of the computer programming type of stuff that, that people may not have backgrounds and they go, well, I can't compete against these guys. And I'm, and what I say is that you absolutely can. You absolutely can. I would say almost certainly that your average lineup is higher EV than my average lineup because I'm not trying to exploit the field and you know how to do that. So I'm, I'm, I have an edge, but it's smaller, but I'm, I'm just entering more volume. Right. But, but, uh, but also you, you, I think you, the standard deviation of your results is lower than mine. That's right. That is the thing that people need to understand about an exploited strategy is it's risky in two ways. The first way is it's just got a higher deviation period because it's more dependent on, on your opponent and what happens. The other thing is if you get it wrong, right. You, you are fucked. well and truly screwed. Yes. Yes. That's exactly. That's <laughs> it. So screwed. So, I mean, but yeah, I mean, I, I would bet good money that your average lineup has higher EV than mine. Right. Well, because... that's, but the thing that you said that's very important about if you're wrong, you're screwed is very much of how I review my play by seeing how accurate I viewed ownership and what would I have done anything different had I known? I always use that had I known X. And that's why I'll look on, you know, like especially on the stuff where you could analyze easier, like showdowns, MMA, and go yeah. like, I thought this guy was going to be, you know, 38% owned. He ended up being 52% owned. Like had I known that, I would have played less of it. Like I, I was trying to play, I thought he was inefficiently owned the wrong way. And then I look back at my lineups and I go, wow, I played like 40 lineups that like would have never made my set had I known X. And to me, that's right. how that that that's how I uh, an exploitative player reviews their play. Because we get some baseball slates where I'm like, 
like, oh, this stack is under the radar, right? Across the industry, it's low owned. Like it seems like it. And for some odd reason, like it's twice as owned than, than ever anyone, anyone else predicted it to be. And I'm like, I played a ton of this. And now like, now I look at it and it's like, it's, it's not over owned, but it's efficiently owned. But then I take a look at the lineups that it's in. It's like, well, these lineups, I played the chalk pitcher combination in because I thought I was. So now I'm looking at all my lineups going, going, if we simulated this out with, with my methodology, these would be unprofitable lineups. And it's all based on the fact that I got, I got ownership wrong. Yeah. You're, and you're on a balance when you're doing it more of a balance strategy. Like that's, it's, it doesn't matter. I mean, you're building, right. like it's you're, you're going to, you're going to, your, your range of returns is going to be narrower. Mine is going to be much wider. And, oh, and do you think, I mean, I'm, a, I'm asking the math person, do you, do you think that that is a justification for me not playing 150 max in contest? Because if I can't be sure of that narrow range that I want to like reduce my risk of ruin as a priority more so than be diversified and play, just get as much volume down. Yeah. You know, I, that's a good question. Cause, uh, cause, cause people have had sharper like, players have, have said, why don't I play 150 max on multiple sites? Like, like I, I do well or whatever. And I, I'm always comes down to like, I play like 1% of my bankroll. It's like, I I'm really nitty. And, yeah. but it comes down to like, I don't have like when I'm wrong, like I don't have the way to, to, to really mathematically, I don't have a piece of software. I don't have my own projections. Like, I'm wholly relying on what I believe the field is going to be doing and exploiting that, that that's the hardest thing to do. So you're going to be wrong a lot. And I'd rather be wrong in 60 lineups than be wrong in 150 lineups. Yeah. Right. So like, I, I don't know. To me, it's a just, I don't know if it's a good justification, but it's but at it least my sense. justification. Your, your per lineup risk is much higher on average than mine would be because you're more concentrated on, on particular combos or teams that you believe have higher EV than is reasonable for exploitive reasons. So it makes perfect sense to me that you would, but I think the tricky thing comes down to, you have to weigh that against the fact that your lineups have higher EV overall. <laughs> so it's, it's, the two sides, like the higher EV should counterbalance to some degree the higher risk, but you'd have to simulate it out. One thing that I do is, um, <laughs> this is a very sobering thing for someone to try to get a handle on how high variance is. If you have good records. Uh, uh, I, I know what you're going to tell me. Don't tell me. Yeah. You, sim you simulated your own contest out and see what the, uh, like what, what the, the range of, how much money you could have won or lost based on simulated contests. Well, I, I do that already, but I was going to, so after every slate, I simulate what was my 50th percentile outcome? What was my 95th percentile outcome? If I had picked a different random set of 150 from the ones my software likes, I do that. Now, what I was going to say is you don't need anything that fancy. Just take every slate you've ever entered and put the net profit or net loss in a spreadsheet. Okay. And then just repeatedly randomly pick one over and over again. <laughs> and that's how you can simulate things like how bad of a, this is assuming that your past results are somehow reasonably representative of your real results. Now, if you've been running like God, like I have been for the last few months, you might want to toss out a few of your, few of your wins uh, just in case they're outliers. But I've done this kind of analysis where I'll say, okay, assume every slate I've ever played is a typical result and just repeatedly randomly pick the result. It's amazing how long you can go on a downswing. Amazingly long. Um, so, yeah, I, you, could, you could script something together with a few dozen lines of Python to do this. Right, right. I, 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 I could do that program. Yeah. I could, oh. right, that, you could do that in Excel. Yeah, sure. Right. I mean, that that's, I mean, just randomly pick and go, this is slate one, this is, and then create the graph of that. Yeah. Right. And, and then do it times. And right. Do it right. And think of how many slates you've ever played. And cause it's going to go randomly. It doesn't just because it picks it once doesn't mean it can't pick it again. I mean, just yeah. that's your set of results. 
And then you go, okay, I've played a thousand slates because I played multiple sports and everything like that. And you go, give me a, th a line of a thousand. Give me a line of a thousand. You'll find so many lines where it's like, well, my current, my real results were I'm plus 200 and whatever thousand dollars. And you'll find some lines where you're down 700,000 bucks. I mean, like you, you find, That's right. <laughs> it's like. I think people just have, it's impossible to wrap your head around just how variant the sport is. I'll give you, I'll give you a number just for MLB. So this is my first MLB season, right? Um, my real return, and this is on like 30,000 entries or something. My real return is like 44%. Okay. If you use my software to simulate the average return for each slate, picking a random set of 150 lineups, not the ones I actually entered, but the random, my real return is my average return simulator would be about 7%. Oh, so that means you're running really well. I'm running ridiculously hard. But you're, but when, when you say you're running well, it's you're running well on picking lineups, not running well on the on the slates themselves. This is just a matter of like, I'm randomly picking 150 out of this set of X thousand. And I just happened to pick like you believe all of these have the same EV. So it's like, there's, there's nothing that would change or anything. It just so happens that you pick the, the right. It's the same thing for, it's the same thing for me since I play all uniques. Yeah, I just had a, I just had $116,000 win in MMA. Yes, and we, I, I played a total of 160 lineups, only 90 in the large, in the, in the biggest, the 200,000, the first contest. And then I played 10 into the, I mean, I just want to win one of them. And as long yeah. as that's more than the amount of entered that that's, that, of course I played the single entry stuff. So 90 out of 160 is so like, so a little bit more than half the time, a, a little bit less than half the time, that lot, that winning lineup ends up in the eight dollar contest, and I win five thousand dollars, right? I win yeah. uniquely for five thousand, or I win one of the other ones for five thousand. The twenty max, I think seventy five hundred or something. But I, I, I put them in rent. I mean, I generate them randomly. Yeah. In the, in the, in the. That it depends on the sport. On baseball, sometimes the higher own lineups go into the different con. Like it, there's a system for that. For MMA, there is none because it's all. It's all just like, who knows? Uh, right. Uh, cause I'm all, cause I'm, I'm building for uniques anyway. So I'm going to be unique in any contest, the large field, small field doesn't matter. Uh, cause to me, it's the worst to play non-unique lineups in the, in the, in like the $5, $8 stuff where five, 5,000 is first. Cause when you split three ways, it's not that much raw money. At least when you've in, split three ways for 200, that's $116,000. But right. look how lucky look when I didn't run well, to make that lineup. I purposely made that lineup. I ran well by the 55% of the time that lineup is going to be in the large field in the one that I win a lot of money and 45% of the time it's not. Yeah. So that's, that's to me, that's what you're saying with the 44% return versus 7% return. These are all profitable lineups. It just, so ha it, it just, which, which ones happen to be in the ones that, that, that you picked randomly right. like that that's that's the running well part or they're not it's not even that it's even worse than that it's not that they're all profitable it's that they're on average profitable right i'm sure some of them are not profitable i'm, I'm very confident <laughs> <laughs> i screw stuff I, I find bugs in my software you know i had uh this is this this is kind of the boring detail but this is the kind of stuff that i spend time on i i discovered so for mlb when it so first of all if it's not obvious already like I don't even know what lineups I have when I enter them, right? It's all, I, I look after the fact, but I'm not making any decisions. The decisions I make are like how to write my software and how to model stuff. And is, is it, are, but, but, you're, but you have to be putting something in to get the, get some type of diversity. It's not like you're not playing no, lineups I'm, that you're, you're, you have the, uh, the same player in a hundred percent of your line. I mean, like, no, but I get that for free because what, what ends up happening is, I, I generate such a huge set of candidate lineups at the beginning that the software inevitably finds a lot of different kinds of lineups that it likes. I, I start to get that. I get the diversity for free. Um, it's Wait, kind of what, what happens. What, what happens if there's certain players that are so dramatically underpriced? I mean, maybe not happen in baseball a lot, but let's say let's say you get the Jake Jacob the Grum is fourth is minimum price on this slate and projects. For a twenty-eight median, like, 
Like it's almost impossible. Like, yeah, it's almost that, impossible not to have him in, in 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 almost all the lineups. Yeah, and that's okay, and that has happened. Uh, that is literally the example I can think of that where that I think there was that one in the early part of the year, and I think I had him. I think he was ninety percent owned, and uh, my software actually thought that was pretty close to efficient. I think I had like eighty five percent or something. Okay, so 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 basically, your software is going to determine what the efficient ownership is anyway. Yeah. So the, the efficient ownership on a, on a particular batter on a slate, may, no batter may have more of a twenty percent efficient ownership. So you're never going to get more than twenty percent of that batter anyway, because your software is not going to allow it to have that higher frequency. Right, because what you, what would happen? If people, if the software started cramming it in, well, then all of the lineups you got crammed into would start having more competition and more dupes. And so the EV goes down. And so it will just naturally start to come down in ownership. And then maybe it goes too far. It's, we're basically looking for an equilibrium here. And so I think that it's funny you, you mentioned batter percentages. I think the highest batter percentage I ever saw from my software in a large MLB slate was Tatis yesterday. Right, because his projection was stupid, right? I think I had, I think it spit out 29% of him. I'd never seen anything that high. And that's what he was owned. He was literally, he was he was owned at 29%. So that was probably about right. Yeah, close to it. But most of the time, it's just every, I mean, you see, you don't need fancy software to see this. When you bring up results to be in the morning, the pattern is always the same with the batters. When you order by ownership descending and then you look at all the sharp players and it's like a whole bunch of yellows at the top right so the, most of the time they're under on whatever the top batters are which makes perfect sense because people play good batters too often in the big slates more often than they should be played right well but highly higher projected batters when there are other batters that are not that much worse projected that are going to be four times or five times less owned. Have have you have, have for do you do a classic slice for NBA? So funny thing about NBA, a couple because, things because I wanted to ask you because we in MLB we have a lot of stuff with correlate. Like to build the lineups, you're constraining a lot of the stuff. Even because you're not built, you're not building a one 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 one. You're not building. You well, may get I, some, there may be some that show up and there may be, but like you, so you have I to, try, I try not to introduce any bias at all. So at the beginning, those lineups will exist as candidates, but because the software knows about correlation and the batters will be correlated, those lineups generally won't get selected because they don't do very well. Most of them kind of suck. <laughs> So they kind of naturally get winnowed out. This is one of the satisfying things about watching your morning show is like, I look at what my software does and then like, you'll say some strategic thing and then I'll look and see what it does. I'm like, Oh yeah, yeah. I figured that out. Cool. Cool. Right, right. I'm, have... I'm glad, I'm glad you wrote, you, you wrote a, <laughs> you wrote a computer program that just, just, why do I, I have to sit and look through all this stuff and that just, well, it just runs, you, you have a little mini, you have a mini me just run, just, just running <laughs> through all the lineups. Well, it's hard because it can be hard when you're, when you're writing, I mean, we can call this AI software, I guess. When you're writing AI software, it can often be hard to know what to take seriously because it's running on huge amounts of data and it's crunching numbers and it's changing strategies and it can be kind of inscrutable. You can't like look at what it's doing and figure out how it's thinking. Right, it it's like a really... black box. It's just like it yeah. comes out with stuff and you like, I don't know why that happened, but apparently that's correct. I don't right. know why it is. I do spend a lot. I like, I'm like, can I take this seriously? Like, or is this good? Or how do I know if this is good? So, I mean, a lot of the times, you know, I'm, I'm listening to your show and I also just like, you know, you know, I wake up in the morning. So I'm in Colorado. So I'm two hours earlier than you. So it's nine in the morning for me. But uh, I'll come on your show and I'll listen to you and I'll start setting up the contest for the day. So I'll download all the player salary CSVs and decide when I'm going to enter and look at my schedule and do the first runs just to make sure it's all working. Um, but, you know, when I hear you talk about a strategy thing or people are, are talking about, you know, different kinds of patterns of lineups and then I'll, I'll look, I'll like, 
I'll be like, okay, that's interesting. And, you know, is, is, is that congruent with what my software actually produces or not? And if, and it usually is. And on the cases where it's not, I'm like, well, does that mean my software's discovered some clever new thing? Or no, it probably means that I'm just wrong. No, or no, it could be, it could be either. Does it mean my software's discovered something cool or there's something janky with the software? And I've been in software long enough to know that uh, all software has bugs and problems. So I, I, um, <laughs> I'm very humble when, it, when, when my software pumps something out that's weird. Well, uh, does it give you, does it give you problems when uh, two Luis Garcias are on the slate? Oh my God. <laughs> And then the CSV from DraftKings does not include the team in it. Right. So to disambiguate, you have to like, there's, there's, you have, yeah. Uh, I hack or, so, or sometimes they'll check, or if, if you're running, like for me, if you're running something that like you already, ha you have for the entire season and they start changing the players' names, uh, right? Yeah. Juniors and they add periods versus like that, like coming, coming from my Pearl background, like I, I'm very, I, I, it, like any extra characters just like blows up anything that I, ever, I have ever done. No, I, I, it's maddening. You mentioned NBA. I want to get back to NBA. Right. But I was going to ask you about, about NBA because the, the correlation means l less and the projections are much more linear. I mean, like it's, it's lower variant sport. Much so, lower. So to me, to me, the exploitative strategy, I, I believe is more effective because like I end up, I basically, I basically end up playing. I play, I, I say it, I say it on the pregame show. My goal is to play good players in bad spots. Like, yep. like just as long as they're a good, as long as they're a, an all-star level player, I'm not trying to play the $3,200 guy off the bench. Just like, Oh, everyone, everyone's paying up for Embiid at center. And it's like, okay, I'll find I'll luck box into some 5k center that gets in because of foul trouble and then find the $8,800 play Zach Levine at 2% owned because no one wants to play him against the Clippers. And it's like, he's Zach Levine. Maybe he puts up 50. Like, and I'm playing those types of lineups. But to me, you can't really do like the projection, like versus ownership. You're giving up a lot of times in, in NBA when we got this guy's out, this guy's sitting. It's like some of these players have such high success rates that you're like, you're get you're that even though they're the highest on player, like, it's not like baseball. It's not like baseball where like, Oh, 30% on batter. Like if, if you want to X them out, like on average, like no batter should ever be that owned in basketball. Yes. You, you could have an 87% owned basketball player that is under owned for their projection. Yeah, and, that's crazy. True. Yeah. and people tr either try to fade that and it doesn't mean you have to play them. You could play a different lineup, but you're giving up so much projection when you fade them in a lineup that like to build a lineup with a high enough projection, you almost get into the to, the point in which your lineup is actually too common. Uh -huh. It's, it's, it's yeah. a, it's a, it's, it's, it happens in showdown a lot where well, if you're going to, uh -huh. let's say you fade the, like the, the 89% on quarterback, that's 10, six, like in showdown, it's like, I'm going to build a lineup without them. And it's like, well, the combination of lineups without them are so lower projected and they're also going to be duplicated. I think on FanDuel, this happens in baseball sometimes where the, the uh, player prices are so whacked out that Otani is going to be oh, all the high price batters are going to be over owned because, yeah. you know, they're the highest projection. But if you don't play them, your lineup is like 25 points projected below everyone else's. And, uh, if you try, oh, I'm going to get different at pitcher. It's like, well, it's still going to be the same bat. Your lineup's still going to look the same. So do you, do you, and talk about your NBA classic stuff, but me specifically with the fact that, that it's almost, you feel reversed that the lack of correlation, I mean, there is some, but not much, but just the fact of like, you're jamming in these like value plays. And yeah. then when you don't jam in the value plays, you have to give some like, I, maybe maybe your software does it. Some type of consideration to, well, if you don't play this and then you try to raise your projection up, you're playing a lineup that actually, like, is is the highest owned version of the non that lineup, but the duplication of like six v six in the lineup, or any lineup that fades that guy is going to likely have 
these six players in it, and then the EV of that lineup goes significantly down because you're sharing it with you're sharing combinations with so many people. Right. So I want to preface this with the fact that on DraftKings, my simulated return for showdown is zero. Break even simulated return showdown on DraftKings. I actually lost about 25k, I think, last season. On FanDuel, where I can't download the CSVs. So we're talking about I, show, is this showdown overall? NBA showdown. NBA showdown, okay. Yeah. So, so did, this is even by winning first place a bunch of times. Yeah. On um, Yeah, absolutely. So th- that's another thing for, for people who play less volume to keep in mind. A lot of the people on the leaderboards for some of these sports are not winning. They're, some of them are losing money. Um, and they, they hit, they bink. Like, if you looked at my NBA... If I look at your Rotogrinders profile, it seems like you bink like every other day at NBA Showdown. No, it's so volatile. Okay, I absolutely... So, I should have had break-even. I was like minus 3% or something. Or On FanDuel, I absolutely crushed it. I think I had like a 50% return or something. I can't, I can't do the simulations because they don't have the CSVs on FanDuel. So... I don't know my, what my true return would have been there, but given everything I've heard you say and my experience as well, if if my return is X on DraftKings, I assume it's some number greater than X on FanDuel, uh, just because it's softer over there. It also so, depends on the format. I mean, I think the NBA Showdown format is a little bit better than their their football format. It's the five the five man rosters and the three spots. Like on a, on a lot of these slates, just there's there's so there's so few uniques that you could obviously I'm coming from that perspective. I'm coming from building the, like I said, the exploitative strategy versus the balance strategy. There's so many more bad lineups on FanDuel that even when you build lineups that tie a whole bunch of times, your, your average return is making money. And on yeah. me, I just look at it as, can I win first place by myself? And if I see they're very limited past to that, I'm like, what, what's my edge here? Like I, like I'm just not gonna yeah. just dump money and just hope for the hope for the, like the bottom thirty percent of the field to just be bad. Yeah. So for NBA Showdown, I'm not convinced my methods can win on DraftKings right now, and I think there's a couple reasons for that. The one of one of them is what you mentioned already. The projections are so tight and and so good. Um, the other is that Showdown has such a limited number of possible lineups. A, a typical NBA Showdown slate, um, if you just include players who have a, any projection of any points at all, there might be 100,000 possible lineups total. Um, so I, I consider all of them as possible, because that's not that many for a computer to handle. And it, it may just be the case that the structure of the contest means a balanced strategy just isn't enough to win you need you, you might need to do exploiting in order to to beat the rake on those um in nfl nfl like my software just crushes the showdown both in real money and in simulations and i think i you would probably agree that nfl is by far the softest sport um but you asked about NBA Classic. I'll get back to that. So I do have a small, a single-digit simulated return for Classic NBA. One thing my software cannot handle, I have no mechanism for handling, is late swap. So for NBA Classic, I'm only entering night slates or slates where all the contests start right around the same time. Oh, so you're oh, so you're not even playing the the main. The main no, because I know how much of a critical critical part of the edge it is to take late news into account but that would be just a completely separate software project to try and incorporate that um but you could but wouldn't you wouldn't i mean uh, is it do you build do you think okay do you is the reason that you think that's a bigger part of a software project because you would want i think a lot of sharper players when we late swap and I'll and I'll if I'm building a ton of lineups, I'm I'm using a late swap tool. I'm using lineup HQ entries manager, whatever. And a lot of times yeah. it's a I'm I'm doing blunt stuff. I'm this guy's out, this guy's in. 
Like I know the I know these guys are going under own. I know this. I know Paul George is out and this thing. And Terrence Mann is going to play thirty four minutes. That I basically say whatever lineup he could fit in, just jam him in yeah. into as much as possible, and just and then whatever I have of everyone else because that's the easiest. I, it's hard with everything locked in place to go through and go. Well, I only want thirty percent of that. I only, like don't yeah. even but like I'm just exploit this guy this guy should be 55 percent owned if we knew this before lock and he's going to be 10 percent owned it gives me so much ev i'm playing just jam him as many places you can but the thing is the other uh the other variables you should be taking into account one of the things of late swap that it's it's near it's nearly impossible to do like just with an optimizer is consider the point of kidding consider the information that you already have that's right. So you already yep. have players that have already played a quarter or a half a, a game that we already have ownership of those players. Like you're, you're soft. You're, if you're just using an optimizer, you're just like, it's going to, it's going to give you the same ownership. It's, it's going to say that so-and-so is 24% on when he really, he came in at 16. So if you're doing yeah. any type of optimization process around ownership, like it's not accurate anymore. Right. Yeah. And then you have to fit everything in is the reason you don't want to do it because building that, you don't want to build the simple version of just like, just oh projections changed, jam them all in. You want you want to be more. It seems like you want to be a little bit more optimal than doing that. Well, so I'm I'm kind of a special kind of nit in this way. Like, the 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 there's two reasons. The first is I have a wife and kid, and I want to be able to see them during the NBA season. <laughs> and if I'm playing the main slate, you just have to be in front of your phone or your computer. Uh, the, whole night. To, the whole night how to be there and I'm, I'm not willing to do that but the other reason is if i'm making all these late swaps like by hand i have no way of back testing anything now right. because all of the and this even happens with mlb where i do have to be around i mean it's not nearly as bad as nba but like yesterday all the dodgers <laughs> lineup change and i'm there for 45 minutes on DraftKings and FanDuel clicking things out. Oh, this one was in a stack. This looks plausible. Oh, I just replaced the same guy five times. I'm going to start. Maybe I'll turn my four of uh, my five stack into a four stack and, you know, mix it up a little. And it's all very ad hoc. And so when I have that kind of slate, I just put like a zero for my expected return because I have no idea how I was doing. If, yeah, if the those, is, those lineups may not make even your candidate set if you ran them. Right, but yeah, and I and I have no way of knowing after the fact how they would have done because they never would have got picked in the first place because the lineups have changed. So, so you must love <laughs> Joe Madden. <laughs> good, good thing the Angels are pretty much bad. <laughs> yeah, but um, but yeah, for for so this whole late swap thing though, it's it's kind of. I think so. This is why I've never spent much time. I've spent all my NFL energy on Showdown and none of it on classic NFL. And I think I just need to kind of grow a pair, uh, run my Sims, and be willing to late swap for NFL because the edge is just so huge that I think even if I'm doing something that's not very clever at all, I think I should still be probably be playing those contests. Yeah, but you can at least play the early only in the afternoon. That's true. That's true. Or if you want to do to... it that way, but also, but, would well, you those contests tend to be sharper? A little, a little bit, but I mean, it's still, I mean, just as much as a turbo or a late slate in, in MLB or anything. But I mean, yeah. but really, the the classic mains are like that's the that's the bread and butter. Are you now in football in NFL? Usually. Not not much information. Nothing would change much, right? For at like you know for the four o'clock games, we're not sitting here waiting for inactives. Is so and so going to play? That doesn't happen. That really, you'll it's know not, that. Like like it it's not going to affect the li- now. That there's, I I think you I know you know where I'm going. It's like it's not going to affect anything at one o'clock at twelve fifty nine p.m. Eastern. So like if you can if. If there was no late swap, like if you weren't able to late swap at the four o'clock games, nothing would have changed from that point. Anything in your software, nothing, there's no, you don't have any new information. All the information from 1259 PM or whatever lock time 
is the same. So it wouldn't affect you. It, 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 as long as everyone's still in, these lineups are still fine. It's the point of, well, since you have the opportunity at four o'clock to make swaps, shouldn't yeah. you analyze all the lineups that what, what they've done and all the ownership of that so you can make positive EV swaps in all 150 of your lineups the best and then you simulate all of that out and then you make those i'm assuming that's like it's it's, that would be that would be the holy grail and because you basically have a multi-step game right Mm -hmm. right it's more like poker where you've got several streets of play right right you've got you're on the river that's that you're 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 on the turn right yeah right because i was at the end on the river then you then like I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna bet on my hand. Like you didn't win the millie maker, I call right. I mean, like that's 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 the easy part. Just get just nerding out uh, to a little bit of an extreme here. It's actually on first examination, it's a much harder problem than what I'm doing now because ideally you need to know you need to look at everyone else's lineups and your own and then recompute from there. Right. Right. Consider all of the late swaps that they could make. And all of the late swaps that you could make. Yeah, but you have to and know the, that most people don't make late swaps. <laughs> of course, yeah. I'm sure something simple would probably be good enough so that I could make profitable lineups. But but yeah, it's just like I'm very skeptical in of my own results and my own ability. Like the, the one thing about my approach that's been good for me and given me confidence is the ability to backtest my results that's why i'm so resistant i've been so resistant to doing things with with late swaps in it because yeah but you have but you have to know it's the biggest edge there i mean i know a few people do it just uh, for nfl i think i'll I'll probably i'll put something together for the main the main at some point your your actual results have to speak for themselves right yeah but it's so i mean is that your is that your is that your version of being a nit like my version yeah. of being a nit is the conservative bankroll management and not playing 150. And your version of being a nit is that like you can't look at your re- you look at your real results versus simulator results and go, well, I can't just look at my real results. I have to constantly look at at this at this back test because I yeah. I look at I look at, a, at this 44 percent ROI and go this can't be real. It's like yeah, it's right. probably not sustainable at 44 percent, but you're probably if. Even in the sample size that you've had over the past year or two, you're a profitable. You're a profitable play. You shouldn't be scared in order to do things that may not be able to be back tested, because right. you're mean, more that's... likely to be correct than not correct. Right. I mean, that's why I jumped into MLB with both feet because I had enough experience with the other sports. And then there were things because when I was first researching this sport i listened to some of your content and some others and it had mlb has some features that were very appealing which and the biggest of them is the extreme variance in batter performance because that is the source of most of the mistakes that people make Uh, i think you've called it like taking the projections too seriously or or over being overconfident in the projections, I guess you would right. say. O- overconfident in the median projections when yeah. the, the range of outcomes is so wide that, like, if, if you were to put randomness of, like, 50%, like, you wouldn't be that far off on a lot of sl- – I mean – like oh, yeah. Like, and when, you, when putting 50% even, uh, normal distribution randomness, like – and then a guy that's projected at 10 is not much different than a guy projects at seven and a half. Like that's right. That what, that why is the guy that 10 getting more ownership than the guy? Like it becomes so inefficient just based on the, on the, on the variance of the sport. Yeah. And I, I think that was, that was definitely appealing. And then Cause um, at NBA, you don't get that right. Cause at NBA, you don't get that as much and golf. You don't get that NFL. You don't get it as you know, that's, that's a little bit more NFL is a little bit, a little bit more efficient. I think people go wrong a lot. A lot of the dead lineups are, are in roster construction types. Uh-huh. Very picture MLB. I mean, to me, picture MLB. Uh, Daniel, in if if everyone played constructionally, if that's a word, constructionally optimal in MLB, wouldn't the edge go significantly down? Like, wouldn't you wouldn't you believe that that if if people if people if everyone played five man, four man, four three one like stacks and lineups like that that 
that the edge in and of itself, like you'd start to get to the point where these three, two, twos become more profitable and these two, right. two, 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 but there's still too many people that play these mostly one off messy type of lineups that like in NFL, I find that's like in NFL, you may find lineups that are like individually like properly leveraged, but the construction, like the, the like the correlation, like you're not, you, you, you have too much stuff going on that even for large field contests, like you'd be better off just three plus one and do, do you know, running back, even running back defense or so, just something where people are still not doing it enough that you could profit just by the construction. Yes. That, that, that it like in, in a sport like NBA, you don't, you don't get that advantage because there really is no, there's no construction. There's no optimal construction type. That you could right. that that within the scope of one standard deviation, that if you played a million slates, you can go. Oh, you take one side. I t- a lot of times I take one side of a game and the other side of the game because there is a small amount of correlation. But once you add that variance, you smack it with variance. Like that correlation doesn't really even matter that much. Yeah. But like it ha- it gives me some solace to like, at least I have a process of so I I don't have 150 smattered lineups that that don't have a story to them especially when everything's going to be even anyway. If given the choice between two players I'm putting in this lineup, I'm going to play the one that's on the opposite side of another player because all things being equal, I'll take I'll take the small bump when all things are being equal. But how do you how do you deal with that in in it's more like NBA like like I I just I it's it's hard for me to understand how your software balances that out in NBA. When when there's no with when the field can't really can't make much construction errors other than like playing two guys that are purposely negatively correlated like playing right, the no. center and the backup side I'm not talking about that I'm just talking about there's like in baseball it's easy to just go okay these messy lineups like you get an edge off of them just by play you can play the worst five three lineup it may still be better than than a lot of those lineups anyway but in basketball you don't you just don't get that benefit yeah that's I think thinking about what you just said that's that's probably why one of the reasons why my nba results have such a low simulated return and another is my software doesn't have an automated way to not put in the center and his backup in the same lineup uh, right? you don't have you don't have a correlation to collect- i tried to automate that and failed now because i was playing such small slates and showdowns anyway um, it's counterbalanced somewhat by the fact that you need to get kind of weird anyway. So yeah, it's a lot prob- of people won't do that and you get the benefit because it's like in sh- a lot of times in NFL showdown, I'll, I'll have some lineups where I'm playing two running backs from the same team, even though they can never be on the field at the same time. But I'm doing so, that because so many people are not playing both run. Like you're getting the ownership edge from doing that. And you hope that just like, I'll play, I'll play all three Patriots running backs in my lineup. And hopefully Burkhead has a touchdown and Harris has a touchdown and Michelle has a touchdown. And people will look at you and go, well, that lineup's awful because because why the hell would you play three guys that can't be on the field together? And I go, you know why? Because no one else is doing it. And I had the only lineup and I want a million dollars. So there you go. That, 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 <laughs> right. I mean, that type yeah. of mentality, but, but in yeah, showdown, not... I could get it. But in, you, so, so, in, but, but uh, aren't you doing that in baseball? Is you it, isn't your software already giving like if one batter does well the project like it's like a correlation boost oh yeah oh yeah so so you're, you're, you're telling me that it's not you're not doing that in basketball no i couldn't get something that I so liked. you can't you can't tell so you can't tell it that if joel Embiid is having a good game dwight howard isn't so i'm not saying it can't be done I'm saying I haven't been able to do oh, okay. it. Yet. <laughs> yeah, okay, so you, you acknowledge that it should be done. It's just that you haven't found the best solution to do so. Exactly. Right. And, and, and a lot. And I know I know what some people listening to this would say. Said that's what you get for not watching the games. <laughs> <laughs> right, because it, it, it's intuitive. Probably for people that know basketball, it's intuitive. Sure. You yeah. can be like, well, if, if this if this jump shooter uh, has a good game. Like off the bench, well, let obviously the other, the first team, like if one guy fouls out, if one guy, like, you know, the rotations enough that's yeah. like when they run with the hot hand, you know who benefits and is negatively correlated. But a piece of software has to, not, it, it, all it's going to do is look at all past games and go, like, where does, where do these go up and down? And sometimes that's still not enough of a sample size to really give, 
give a, 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 a qualitative statement on the correlation between two players. Yeah, so I'll tell you, I actually went down this rabbit hole and tried to do what you just described. And it's it's almost like there's, there's in a way, there's too much data because it, it would look back to... So if I'm just considering the correlation between two players and I download a giant data set from some NBA results site, it, you could be correlating these two players' data back from when they played under a different coach, a completely different scheme. So you, you actually need, I feel like, I, I don't remember who was on your show, it's like, I, I don't do NBA fully automated. And I feel like these kinds of considerations are why. Um, understanding rotations of players and who's correlated with who and why, and these things clearly matter. And I think, I think they matter enough that, that if I were to try NBA again, I would, I would be really looking at how to do that. Right. I, um, I, if, you, if you noticed, I, I, on Lineup HQ, went back when I did NBA, sometimes I'd make 30 groups on a slate. I mean, yeah. sometimes I'm going no, through each no, team. I'm like, I think I'm missing something important here. Like, is it important enough that I'm, I can't win? I don't know. Right. You probably can okay. win without doing that. Because I take a look yeah. at some of these lineups. Some of the lineups towards the top on some slates are lineups that I would have never created because – it's like these two players are negatively correlated to one another, but it just so happened that the starter was hot and then they blew out the team and then the backup, you know, the, 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 the sixth guy off the bench, you know, comes in for the last 12 minutes of the game and he, and he's only 3000 and he puts up, you know, 40 points and it's like someone played them together, right? A lot of times you won't see the two centers together, but like I, a lot of times I don't play centers against each other. Starting uh -huh. centers against each other because of foul, because that's the highest correlation to foul trouble, right? So, like, I'll play the back. I don't mind playing the backup center versus the starting center, right? Because one, this Embiid fouls Drummond, fouls, you know, Drummond fa uh, gets two, three fouls on Embiid, and then the backup comes in and Embiid feasts on the backup, but the backup also plays, you know, the second center plays 28 minutes and he's 3,600. So uh -huh. I could play both guys in the lineup because the one guy, one they'll both get there. But playing both high price centers against each other, yeah. But there, are, there are plenty of games where both of them like have put up, you know, Embiid puts up thirty six and 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 twelve, and Drummond has eighteen and twenty two, and they're both up. I mean that that does happen. Uh, but I sure. limit my I those aren't part of my candidate set of lineups and if they happen, they happen. But that negative correlation is not, it's, it's not it's huge, huge enough for you to not have it as a candidate. It's just that I have no way of doing that naturally. Like it's either is or it isn't. And because I don't have a process like you do, I just have to make the hard rule of just like, they're not together. And if I just lock my, if I just lock myself out, I used to do, I don't do as, as much anymore of uh, on large slates, uh, not playing three outfielders from the same team uh -huh. uh, in, in, in MLB. Because okay. I, I will confess, this is the one point uh, on your show. I don't think I ever fully understood it. So maybe you can explain it to me. Again. What was the thinking behind that? For large field GPPs, you have to weigh two things. You have to weigh, uh, obviously, the projection leverage correlation, but you also, you're trying to get the nuts, right? So like, in MLB, the nut lineup most days is a all one-off lineup. It's just a how, how do you hell do you get to that line? Like that's the problem, right? Sure. So if if you went and you did what's the best possible lineup for all the salary, it'll always come out to be some messy lineup. Yeah. But it's gonna be in, like there's you know how many combinations of those lineups there are billions and good luck good luck figure out which ones it's gonna hit that specific probably day. trillions actually I right. Some yeah. Uh so. In order to get the nuts, this is very similar to like uh, in, in small field versus large field. In small field contests in MLB, most of the time I play 5-3 or 4-4. Four, four. Let me just get two teams right. I don't need the nuts. If I have, a, I could win with a three in my lineup if I get the two teams right and the two pitchers right. Done. Yes. And my, large so my software confirms that the smaller the GPP, the more it likes the 5-3. Now the large field GPPs, I'm more concerned about getting the nuts. Now, the catcher spot, there's only so many combinations. I mean, how how many people are eligible to catcher? How many people are eligible at all these positions? Well, the mm -hmm. outfield is the one that has the most amount of eligible players. And 
a lot of them are power hit. I mean, a lot of them are power hitters. You get more uh, home runs in the outfield than you will at second base, than you will at catcher. So if I'm looking to optimize for the nuts, it's more often than any other position that there'll be a one batter outside of a stack, meaning that the team scored four runs, but this guy hit two home runs in the game. It's more likely to happen at outfield. Mm -hmm. That the benefit of having lineups that are that are open to having a one-off outfielder are more valuable than having the correlation of the five guys in your stack, three of them being in the outfield. Now, cool. Am I? Do I have any data to prove that? No. It's it's it, but, more of intuitive. Uh, experiments for you on that one. That's an interesting hypothesis. Um, I understand. Okay, I get what you're saying now. Um, right, because I, I that because I. I would look at the Red Sox and go, do I want to play Renfro, J.D. Martinez, and and Verdugo or something in the outfield and play Ploiecki and Devers or so, some type of lineup like that? Or that's where that's where the whole thing of like, I'd rather fill up my stacks with catchers and middle infielders where the chances of a one-off burning me are lo- so much lower, right? Uh-huh. Then and at the outfield of stacking an entire team, I need to make sure all three outfielders do well on a, we have a 15 game slate tonight, like getting three points out of an outfielder. Like I may, there there's going to be another outfielder at that price range that puts up double digits and someone will have the four, three, one or the four, three, you know, like the five, one, one, one versus the five, three or the five that has that guy. If the guy is owned at any extent, I'm not talking about the 1% on guy, but a 6% on guy. That I'm sitting with the same lineup, but I lock my because I'm forcing. I'm saying that I I want all. I don't mind all three outfielders. I've now locked that lineup out from, you know, uh, uh, Aristides, uh, Aristides Aquino three home runs, and it's like he's he's tw- six uh, he's six uh, percent owned, and he's the only guy in the Reds. Like the Red Stacks don't get there, but he's owned enough that that one like you're gonna need that one off around whatever stack that you have, and my Alex Verdugo twelve means that my lineup now comes in 14th place. Mm, mm. Right? Does it at least make intuitive sense to you? Sort of. I, I'm, I'm a little slow, but um, I'm a unless, slow Unless thing. I'm wrong, unless I'm overvaluing this. Unless I don't, it's, it's really interesting. I, I find these kinds of things hard to reason about because the number of possible lineups is just so vast. Um, I mean... But you'd have to you have to admit on the other end of the spectrum because you can think the other way also, right? I think you have maybe to, you have to admit that getting a home run at catcher is more valuable than any other position, right? In the sense that there's only so many choices at catcher, and there's well, only and there's only so many good hitters at catcher that you, you getting the home run at catcher, everyone else has three points in their lineup and you have eighteen, and there's only there's less catchers that actually do well that it's almost more important to get points at catcher than it is yeah. at outfield, even though yes. there's, cause there's more chance of you getting an outfielder that puts up double digits. Well, because if, if there's, if there's 30, let's say there's 30 eligible catchers and two of them put up two home runs, there's going to be a, far more people who have that catcher than have the one outfielder who got, three home runs and a triple because there's only one of him out of the 300 outfielders, but there's two catchers you need to have, but there are only 30 choices. So you, it's like you, it's more required that you have it because you have fewer choices. I think it's more required based on you have fewer amount of players that can do it. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. It's like if there's, if there's, if there's 30 catchers and 10 of them hit a home run, doesn't really matter what catcher. I mean, at that point, like, oh, I don't have, I, I didn't have Sal Perez. Yeah, but I have Armar Narvai. Like, it doesn't, it's like one of those things where people sweat. I see it in the Roto Grinders Discord where, uh, like, especially at first base, like a first baseman will hit a home run and they go, ah, oh, I played Freeman over Goldschmidt, right? And then Freeman will hit a home run. And they go, okay, I got like, like, I'm now I'm still a home run behind. It's like, you're not a home run behind. No one on DraftKings, on FanDuel you can because you have the utility, no one in DraftKings could have Goldschmidt and Freeman in their lineup at the same time. So right. as long as you get a home run at a first base, whoever wins first base, that's that, that's all that matters. Just same thing for catcher. 
Same thing for right. outfield. It just I you I think to have one of you needed to, at least one of them. Right. It's important that you got one because a lot of other people did. Right, but but, Whereas, but based on but to me based on that there are more permutations of lineups with the outfielders. Uh, uh, right, because you under you understand because if I if I'm now obviously we have some multi positional guys that are you know second base shortstop first base third base but if we lock I mean they they're worth a little bit more also but like if seven if ten ten home runs are hit on the slate and five and five of them are at first base like right. like like no one could have them all because right. they're all at but I could guarantee you if the other five are an outfielder. It's going to be one of those home runs at first base and all three outfield home runs. Like, so it's that type of mentality of like, uh, I, I, I don't care about the catcher, the scarce positions as much because it's less likely that I'm going to be burned by it because no one could have two of them. But in the uh, outfield, if, if three outfielders hit two home runs on the day and they're more than 5% owned, you need all three. You need all three, right? But yeah. in catcher, you don't need all three. You just need one of the three uh-huh. to get to make the... And I'm talking about, this is obviously thinking for a large field where you're aiming for the, yeah, to yeah. beat 70,000 opponents rather than beat 500 opponents. I don't care about that. I'm talking about how do... Am I locking myself up from the nuts by doing that? But I mean, I'm assuming that you could write something that could back test this type of Yeah, I could thing. do that. Yeah, that, homework, yeah homework. like yeah, like maybe, maybe. It, to me, it <laughs> sounds to me it sounds logical, but maybe, but maybe it's not. Maybe because I see plenty of sharp lineups that have three outfield, and and I still I make those lineups also. But I've always suspected that, like in the large field stuff, it may not be optimal. Given the choice between two equal lineups, uh-huh. wouldn't I rather have the Boston Red Sox lineup with Bogarts and Devers and two of their outfielders rather than? Three of their outfielders. If if you tell me that the ownership and the projection were equal, it like, might come down. It might come down to just the combinatorics where, if you do stack and you put three outfielders in in your stack, just because all the other positions are so much more constrained, you've greatly reduced the remaining combinations of lineups. Th- that also, you know, I agree with that as well. It could be that, um, but. Yeah, I, I can look at it if, if I'm if I'm feeling frisky with my programming and I want to look and, at and, something. And, and, if, and, if, and if you find that there's an edge in that, you'll never tell me. <laughs> no, I, just look at my lineups and you'll be able to tell. Right, I'll be uh, able, I'll look at your lineups and I go, oh, oh, n- never uh, for the past three weeks, never, never three outfielders from the same team in this in this like, oh. Oh, but if my if my software thinks it's a thing, it'll already be in there. Oh, so so, so maybe it doesn't think it's a thing. No, but I haven't looked for it. It could already. You might be right. Is it? Is it you, that type of black box thing of like it's making these yeah. lineups and you're not sure why, but you haven't yeah. looked at that variable, so you wouldn't have even seen why it would or would not be making those lineups. Yeah, I haven't examined it. This would require no new um, AI programming. It would just be a matter of looking at the outputs and doing some data crunching. How often do you stack with three outfielders as opposed to not? Um, that would be the that would be interesting, yeah. It's um, yeah, it's it's a it's a really different way of doing things to to try and extract. Yeah, I'm not telling the software what to do. I'm I'm giving it sort of free reign, and then I'm trying to learn from it. Um, I, I've like basically never played DFS like a normal person. Like I've never really constructed a lineup. So so ba- uh, ba- basically, you're not playing. It's Skynet is playing. That's right. Yeah, this is great for all the conspiracy theorists. You know, <laughs> I have secret botnet in Russia with slave laborers computing lineups. For, yeah, um, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. I think um, I was thinking earlier about the stages of poker evolution versus DFS, and there's some an- analogies there too. Where you know you, you had the first phase of poker, which was Poker knowledge, which is like the Sklansky Malmuth books and strategy stuff. I would consider stuff. that the second phase. Okay, it's maybe second phase. First phase is just roadhouse gamblers just figuring right. stuff out. But I guess the first, the second phase of DFS might be. I think I don't we're know. in the second phase. I think this is I the second think phase. Third phase. Well, the second phase, I was going to say, like, 
decent projections are available. Right. Well, right. yeah, because you weren't around in the first. I, I was barely around in the first phase. The first phase was, do you know what the starters for the NBA teams are going to be? Right. And not the guys that are injured that day. Yeah, like that was yeah. the first phase. <laughs> that was enough to win, apparently. But now, now we're sort of like in the phase where we have things like equity calculators for poker and then analogy would be like an optimizer and things like things like um slate iq Mm -hmm. where they you know they which is sort of like a hud in a way you can think of it as a hud after the fact i guess where you're you're looking at the tendencies of other people right right and trying to compute what what's good equity against the tendencies of other players um i think the third the third phase of poker is solvers. Well, the third, third, that's, uh, the third phase yeah. of poker is solvers. Do you think we're going to have, do you think the software that you're making that you have will be the type of thing that like, Oh, I could use your software for 50 bucks a month type of. Well, I think that's the kind of thing you, you were, you were badgering one of your previous guests for. Where right. You to run to the do. Sims. Right. That's what <laughs> yeah, I want. I like, want, I want to be I able want. to run the actual contest and be able to upload my projects, player projections and my ownerships. And I want it to run 10,000 or whatever amount of Sims and then show me the lineups that are the highest EV. Yeah, I think that's possible. I mean, there, there's not a lot of incentive for somebody like me to do that unless, unless I thought I could, you know, make a lot of money doing it or somebody else. But I think eventually someone's going to, you know, someone's going to someone, do it. Right? it, it yeah. It's the same analogy to po- I, 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 yeah. this is all, Poker, like when I I put, I I did, I mean, when I started in October, 2015, my first reaction based on how I learned poker is this is pop. This game is popular enough. There should be a theory of daily fantasy sports. I'm going to go on Amazon and there's going to be a book that's going to tell me all the game theory, all the the, the exploitative stuff and all all the, the fundamental theorem type of shit. And there wasn't like Bales had some books, but it was still like kind of arbiter beginner type of stuff. And then it's like, it goes on and on. And then I learn on my own. I was just like, how do I relate the poker stuff to DFS? How do I, how do I study the, okay, move sport to sport. And then no one is like fucking, it's not like David Clancy was the best poker player. He was a right. good poker player. He was a middle limit, hold him yeah. profitable grinder. 1530. Right. That's the, that's what I played. That's what, that was my favorite game. I, I play the 3060 a couple of months, a couple of times a month. Right, two three uh, chip line structure. I love that. Right, it's much better than I had that. It's 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 fifteen thirty are the blinds. Right, I'd much prefer twenty thirty. But, uh, uh, but the point is that someone's like like everything that I'm explaining is not like new. Like I, I'm not special. It's like okay, yeah. this, this is stuff that people are doing. We have a show like this. Uh, we're expl- we're the kimono is open. I mean, you're not going to give your exact software here. Here's my stuff or everything. But it's like this is the way you should be thinking. And yeah. I know that 90, just like in poker, the books came out and everything, 2003, you could still go on party poker and just grind out like four big, five big bets an hour in some of these limit games, which is like nutso. Just playing monkey straightforward, you could play with a hand chart practically and and that's it and make money. But eventually, like the information comes out and people still don't do it because they want, they want to have fun and gamble and, and you have enough of those people I view that the same as DFS is like, well, someone's going to come out event. It will happen. Why can't it be me? And if I, if there's still 95% of people that are not doing this, I get the best of both worlds, right? I get to teach others, right? I get to make money off of that and then make money off of the play. And 10 years down the road, it may not be like 10 years down the road. The stuff that we're talking about right now, maybe like the, like, Oh yeah, that, that's the commonplace. Like I listen to poker. I listen to poker stuff now. Yeah. And some of it is over my head. So like, sure. so, like, like I, I could beat the card room games here in Louisville at the casino using, using Dan Harrington on hold, using the two plus two strat stuff like that. But it, you don't get as many bad, bad players anymore, but there's still people with suboptimal frequencies. Like they're just like, you could totally exploit them. Uh, but some of the stuff playing against good players, I, I, I'm, pro- I probably, my my 2008 version of me, which is what was basically what I am currently, because I don't I haven't played seriously then. You'd probably destroy me, right? Yeah, it's so. One random thing I did in my background, I um, I did for a while. I thought I was going to do um, 
training software using Poker AI. So I was writing the first AI I wrote uh, was Heads Up Limit Hold'em because there's a large body of research and so there's public available papers and I could read them and implement it. So I mean, that's I a solved game though, right? It is now, right. but it wasn't at the time. So there was the annual computer poker competition and Heads Up Limit Hold'em was the game. So I did that a couple of years. I think I, I think I got like second or third one year in that. But as you say, now it's a solved game. But I ended up going in a different direction and doing different stuff. But I played that AI a ton, just testing it. And I've actually studied with it a lot. And I've, I've studied with a lot of the modern stuff and looked at solver outputs and stuff. And I play 3060. And when I go play 3060, the thing that is so striking to me now, and I used to play low limit in the Bay Area. I played like 3.6 and 6.12. Right. But I'm a, a little richer now and a little bit better at poker. The thing that struck me was just how wide the differential in skill was at, this, at a single table. You had people who were, who were basically unreformed fish from 2008. Then you had semi-pros who are good enough to win a little bit of money, and then but who hadn't changed their strategies that much. And then there are people who had clearly studied and caught and kept up with all of the all of the solver research and that's, that's been done and all the stuff that's been discovered. Um, it's a fascinating dynamic because you could see you could see good players. Who, who you could tell were pretty good, but were still, they, they hadn't caught up with all of the latest research. And you could just tell by looking at which hands they played, um, because there's been, there's been some subtle advances in the ranges that, that are optimal, our understanding of what they are. And then there's other people who are like, oh, he knows to three bet this spot with the eight, nine suited. Clearly he's looked at the, <laughs> right. I mean, he's, at this solver output before um, because nobody else at the table ever do, does that stuff. So it's really interesting. I think the, the thing that worries me about DFS, not like it's my personal baby or anything, is poker always has live poker. Like, even if online poker becomes unbeatably hard... Live, live, be people, I don't think people understand how soft live poker really is. Amazing. I would say the 3060 I play in is softer than the online 3-6 I used to play. Right. Ten times the stakes. Um, it's not an exaggeration. But DFS doesn't have that. DFS, there's no such thing as live DFS, not really. And so my worry with, with the advancement of DFS is you could get to a point where the software is so good and enough people are using it that nobody can beat the rake anymore. <laughs> that's, yeah, but, but, that's, do, do, but can't you tell... From I mean, you you watch my shows, you see yeah. on Twitter that there's still like in poker, like you you have the people like there's still people that play poker, live poker, that believe believe in the the supernatural stuff. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, to believe yeah. in the my lucky dealer and the flop lag stuff, all the stuff that like is just all superstition, and they they will never get away from that worldview. But yeah. the thing is, at the at the poker table, I, from my vast experience of playing live poker, even the people that quote believe it, know it's foolish, uh -huh. and it's part of the entertainment of of playing. Like they they know they know that there's no such thing as a hot dealer, but they want to believe in something so their luck turns around. You'll get yeah. that at you'll get that at live poker. It's not as much as it was maybe 12, 15 years ago or so. Yeah. But in DFS, the, the, I think there's, it's weird to, I, I think DFS is, I mean, you would agree, DFS is a much more complicated game than poker. In some ways, yes. Right. In poker, yeah. there's fine, like, from uh, the, from uh, a perfect information perspective, it's, At it's, least, right. it's very easy to, to for uh, even an average to below average player to understand that there's 52 cards in the deck. There are four of like the probabilities. They may yes. not they may not know that uh, you know oh a gut shot hits at this rate, but they know that it's a longer shot than this than this. Like they they get the sense that there are probabilities involved. They may be they may be 
you know, they're calling too big of a bet on the, the end based on some type of frequency. They're, you know, they're, hey, I'll call you, I'll call you, I'll call you, I'll call 10 bucks into a $20 pot on a gut shot when you shouldn't, right? Like those right. types of things, because they're not doing the math exactly, but they know but that there is something involved. Right. In and, principle, you could solve the math problem on pencil and paper, whereas in DFS, I cannot compute the odds that my pirate stack is going to go off. Right, but because that it's going to be in the winning line. <laughs> but because of that, that black box. I I like I like that term like with your software being kind of a black box that you programmed, but poker is less of a black box. You could see like, oh, yeah. you got lucky to get that hand cuz there was only four queens left in the deck. There's so much in DFS, you know, when I in soccer when I get a goal out of a player, and they oh you luck box into that goal. It's like well his goal scoring odds was plus two hundred, right? Like it's his goal score and then I, I there's there's so many variables that based on this model, like he's gonna score that he's gonna score nineteen points, at least nineteen points uh, to twenty eight percent of the time. So like is that really lucky? Like it's like is is like but that's the black box and people that are bad DFS players or average DFS players, we could tell by the content that's around a lot of the industry on predicting yeah. outcomes for a specific day. Uh, this this yeah. is going to happen today. Like, <laughs> like because of that black box, don't you think that getting to the point of solvers playing against one another in DFS is much further away because there's going to be so many more, you know, casual or average players. I think the only difference is, is that as time goes on and we've seen it, we see it now. I mean, the players that were profitable in 2012, most, are not anymore. And well, as the time goes by, like that will, that will still happen, but I don't think there's going to be some type of switch where, you know, even five years, I think 10, I, you're, you're maybe in the high stakes. Maybe there may be some, you know, like maybe more 150 maxers, but the contest will just get bigger. I mean, I see the, the contests on DraftKings, they just get bigger every year. There's more new people that they don't, that whole concept of playing, taking a little bit of money and turning into a lot will never go away. And the vast majority of people that play are your average Joes, even yeah. in our little bubble of like, Oh, Roto grinders. It's like I, I, someone from DraftKings gave me an example and uh, said, I don't think they've ever done it, but they never said if they did or not. Uh, they, they, they said, uh, this is someone higher up at DraftKings. They said, if we gave a poll, we sent out a message and everyone on our platform was required to respond. So you're going to get a response from everyone. And they have three to 5 million. At that point, it was like three to 5 million users. And we asked them, have you ever heard of Roto Grinders? Which for all intents and purposes, is the most known content yeah. site. It was the first and most known ever, whatever. Uh, yeah. They said 97% would say no. <laughs> That's an amazing number. Okay, so put that that into perspective. Yeah, but understand I mean, that we, we're dealing with like the 80-20 rule of like 80% of the entries in the DFS contest are being put into right, by 20% of the people. Uh, uh, but that other that other is just a whole bunch. That's millions of other people. Like that's where all the dead money is. And yeah. that exists. So going in this like little bubble of saying, oh, it's just... It's it, uh, Daniel Hutchins is going to start dirtytenor.com and uh, you, you get to play against his AI and get your simulated results and he'll charge you X amount per month and then you don't even have to play DFS anymore because he's like, you'd make more stable money by just charging thousands of people that and then everyone's playing. The, you get to pick your random 150 against my random 150 against your, <laughs> like, when does, it, when does it ever, like, where all the contests are that, like, I don't see that like, I don't see that ever happening. Yeah, you may be right. I think I think the fact that you have the combination of very large contests and caps on entries, I, I guess it's just my, my inner paranoid coming out. I, I think you're probably right that it's 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 not anytime soon. But um and there also there'll be other exploits. Yeah. And there'll be there'll always be new stuff to figure out. I um I, I, I think, you know, I, I should, I'm planning what my next sport should be. And it's... don't, not MMA. Don't be MMA. <laughs> Get out of my MMA. <laughs> uh, 
probably MMA. Yeah, it should. It really, based on what you do, it really should be MMA. I mean, it really is like showdown. Yesterday, I just did a, I just threw together something to just to compute the number of uh, lineups uh, that are possible. I think it was a 12 fight slate. Yeah, that's coming up at. a 12 fight slate. Uh, yeah. Uh, how many lineups are possible where no fighter faces another fighter? Um, it was like 50,000. Right, I know. Yeah, it's, so it is showdown. Is That's right in the showdown territory. Wait, wait until you get uh, cancellations and it's only a nine fight slate. You may f- you may find out on nine fight slates that you that there's no lineup that's plus EV. Uh-huh. There's, there's, yeah, literally, but... there's literally no lineup that's plus EV. Yeah. Because of the I, duplication you... of everything. Yeah, you need you need people to make major ownership mistakes, right? Showdown is such a funny. I think Showdown is really brilliant because there are times where because the chalk smashes on Showdown, the only people who can win are the average Joe on the couch, right? Because anyone who mass entered lost. Right. So if you so played you one lineup some... and you had that tied lineup, you had you had a nice day, even though you had a yeah. negative EV lineup over yeah, time. You had a... Or 20x or something. I think that's a really brilliant feature. It's 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 frustrating, but it, that's I think that's one of the reasons that it's so profitable. It's almost like a like a quantum contest where it's either it's either a million up top, fifty thousand up top, or twenty five hundred up top, and you don't know until after the contest is over right. which it's going to be right. And we're all playing for the first two, and then there's a bunch of people playing for the for the third thing. Yeah, but they're, um, we're, we're, we're all paying the same amount. That's right. Yeah, so it's a fun. It's a funny. The swings are, are unbelievable in showdown. Um, yeah, because if the chalk hits, you're dead. I mean, like you, yeah. you, my you, I had days were my simulated results, not my actual results. The simulated results were like minus ninety two percent. Uh, that's hard to do in any other format. I mean. Yeah, but to me, that makes it more important that you, that, like, that I, my MMA stuff, it, 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 but it, it's just good timing that I, I tweak my MMA process literally yeah. the day before <laughs> I won the most amount of money in MMA. Hashtag, hashtag rigged, you know. Right. No, but I did it, I did, I did it for three weeks. So I won, I won the 555 that way and I won 4,000 the week before. I came in like fourth in the large field. Like, so like the process I was, I changed three weeks ago, but like to incorporate that into what I was doing in Excel, like that's what I was doing just so uh-huh. I could do, I, I would, I could do it at scale, but it all, it all came down to me, the duplication Cause most, cause it used to be, I would do the same type of process I would do in the, in the classic slates for other sports of using ownership product, usually product over some, uh, and then finding the lineups that. Or have the lower products that don't have the combination, like two fifty percent on fighters. I, uh, I'm barely ever gonna have in a lineup together, right? I'm not gonna have one with the opponent of the other guy, right? So I'm I'm yeah. manually building these lineups like this, going going. I'm taking ownership into account, but I'm using owner like it. It's not ownership product or ownership sum is not the best way, but it's a blunt way of doing it. So I was getting by, but I was finding that I would st- I'm still not making unique enough lineups. I'm running in, I'm, I'm running a hundred lineups and I would get like eight uniques and like 12 under five. And, and then like, and then we'd start getting to the ranges of lineups that I don't really want to play. And then I look at other people's, I'd, I'd look at sharper players lineups and, oh, so-and-so had, some people don't have that many, like some, some people play much balanced and whatever it is, but some people that I, 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 I know play a lot of uniques, like 150 lineups, 118 uniques. Like how the hell did you end up with that? And I look at some some of these lineups are really bad. I mean, some like are very high standard deviation lineups. But I'm like, how do I get somewhere in the middle of that? So yeah. all 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 I did is I try I tried to come up with some blunt way of incorporating the ownership into the actual projection of what I'm building. I'm basically using the optimizer against itself. Uh huh. Yeah. So like was- the the projection and the optimizer is not the projection. It's just like the calculation of like the, the lever quote unquote leverage calculation. So yeah, now I don't have to worry about the more, le- the higher the number is, the more, the less likely it's duplicated just in and of itself, because 
No one uh-huh. would be playing the, the 5% don't fighter with the 12% don't fighter with the 18% don't fighter and fade the top three. Oh, and that's the highest EV, EV lineup. Of course, the standard deviation is ridiculous. So I don't want to play 100. I don't want to play like the top 20, just that. I want to be more diversified. So that's when I add the caps to the to the fighters. So I'm like, okay, if I if I only played the top 100, you know, leverage lineups, I'd have 50% of this guy and 50% of this guy because these are the two big underdogs that are way under-owned. And it's like, well, I don't want to have my whole slate based on that. So like, I'll cap them at 30 each and then let it build. the. But like, just knowing that I'm already factoring in the ownership into the actual projection is something I never did in other sports because it would it there's too many outcomes for you to do it that way. Like you wouldn't just go, okay, we have a batter that has a 12 point median projection and then he's six percent down. So let me multiply those numbers and Fernando Tatis has a four per four point projection because he's over owned. Like I'm not gonna build like the lineups aren't gonna make sense. Because I'm never going to get to tease. Like, I would just, like, literally never get him. But in MMA, the the results are so much more linear. I don't even care about the median projection. I just, like, because you're never going to get 60 points. It's going to be 100 or, like, 10. Like, so, like, so what does the median even matter anymore? I could put zeros there, and it doesn't matter. So I feel like I, that, that was, like, putting the exploitative strategy, like, literally into the projection very clever hack it's it's like but it's a ha- but you have but you have to admit it's a hack it's that's it's no, not, no, it's not I, a mathematically I accurate way to do it. i i don't i don't mean that as an insult at all it's a clever hack it's like you're optimizing for jordan points right which, like a fusion of the median that could be the title for your puck um what, what's, what's the, the title the jordan points jordan point, I, I i wanted the black box <laughs> that's fine too. we have that's a lot sexy. of black boxes <laughs> well people have asked me i did that video and people at like I, sh- I sh- your model, right? My mo- I called it my quote model, right? Because it's not really a model. Uh, yeah. But I sh- I like and people at, uh, that people like I said you could do this. Like I showed all the information. Like and th- yeah. there there's one person that like, literally like emailed me and said said I have I have your I have your I I recreated your entire spreadsheet. The only thing yeah. that he had to ask was uh, what are the weights that you get so you get to your rating and and you know oh. and and you know what I said I said I can't tell you that. Can't you tell you that? I can't give you everything. Right, and I said it, it's going to be different depending on what, like on smaller slates, wins mean more. So you wait that a little bit more. Is is my formula back tested? Absolutely not. It's based completely. On, there's no. There's it. This seems about right. I look at all the, the 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 fighters and how they relate to to each other, and I go, yeah, that it's it's a way for me to make get the optimizer to build lineups. It's not a way for me to predict out it predict anything. Other than I want more of this guy, more of that guy, and I want the same people in the same lineups together. So the ratings, in and of itself, like don't aren't. There's no way to back. There's no there's no predictive element of that. But if I gave you the exact numbers, you could build the exact lineups as me. And we're playing a we're playing a game where I don't want duplication. I can't give you the exact numbers. No, yeah, especially not. Well, I think the phrase you use a lot, which I think is very apt, is is being directionally correct. Mm-hmm. And I think you, you've talked about also, I remember you were talking about simulating actual games, like trying to like how hard it would be to like simulate an actual NFL game or an actual NBA game right. and do it that way. And and how you can if, if you make some bad assumptions, you could they could spiral out of control and just throw your whole calculation off. But there's also a way where you can have a positive reverse kind of thing happen where there you have a very noisy process, but a lot of the noise cancels itself out. For instance, my, my software makes very simplified assumptions about how to, how to simulate, let's say, I guess the easiest is NBA. So simulate an NBA players, a fantasy point production. Okay. So, if you just take the median and have some rough idea of a standard deviation, you can pretend it's normal. And for NBA, that's probably pretty good. It's it's not normal in real life at all. Um, I once went through the exercise of doing something far, far more sophisticated. I 
went through history basically of all the NBA slates I had and all the projections I had. And I basically bracketed the projections. I grouped them. So I said, okay, look at the guys who had 35 to 40 points and the guys who had 40 to 45 and 20 to 25. And then I looked at what their actual fantasy projection was and what the actual production was over a large number of games, right? So, and then instead of simulating a normal distribution, I just picked a historical data point and plugged it in, right? On the theory that this is using like a large data set of real numbers, right? And so I, I spent a couple days on this and I plug it in and I back test it and I had exactly the same EV. There was <laughs> no change, zero. Like it was 0 0.02 or something, ROI difference. So even though my first way of doing it is clearly wrong and noisy, it is kind of wrong and noisy in a balanced way. <laughs> and it didn't really matter in the end. Um, so, so sometimes you get that where you make a bunch of simplifying assumptions and some of them are wrong, but hopefully some of them are wrong in different directions, you know? And they and they cancel each other out. So even though you didn't back test your mental process, it could still be re really really close to to the real thing. Right. You know? well, that, to, to me, I, I view that very similarly to uh, judging your results in GPP to like top one percent finishes. Like that isn't the best way. That that isn't the most accurate way of doing it. But it's somewhat accurate that if if you're yeah. placing more than your fair share of lineups in, in the top percentiles that the rest is kind of variance up to that point. So if you're, if you're placing, you know, 2.8% in the top 1% and you're, you've, you're, you're negative on the season. It's like you, you've been getting, you've been getting really unlucky. Like, but I could look at that through CSVs. You're doing it through real versus simulated. Like I don't have that. I don't have that software. I have that ability to do that, but here's a blunt way. Just like when I talk about ownership, sum. The most a lot of like lineup each you has oh the, you add up all the ownership together and like that isn't product would be better than that and even product isn't isn't the best because you know 50 50 50 50 point one is like that's a leverage lineup even though the sum is high but most people just are, are coming from the point of they're not going to be able to make this software they don't even they barely understand the concepts to begin with yeah give them some type of to showcase some type of part so they get the concept of here's the projection here's the ownership you want to balance you want you don't want the highest you don't want the lowest but you want that nice balance and you could find a ton of lineups in this range the differences between there are going to be differences between them your software will point them out there'll be two percent here and two percent there and three percent there but i'm dealing with people that are coming from playing lineups that that are either way too chalky or way too. So if you at least get in that range, you're now at least thinking conceptually. Yeah. So you can now be more directionally accurate and now tweak your process without needing software by using blunt tools, by being able to, to you go into an optimizer and you go, I'm going to play 150 lineups and let me see what the top uh, projected lineup is. Oh, 220% owned. And it's the two chalk things together and everything like that. And you go, okay, Scroll all the way down. Keep on scrolling until you see a lineup that you like, that you that you that you believe. I'm not even going to tell you if it's right or wrong. Just tell me. Keep on scrolling down to a lineup that you think is contrarian enough for the contest that you're in. They go, they scroll all the way down, they show it to me, and then I go, okay, what's the owner? What's the projection and what's the ownership sum of that? Oh, well, it's 175. Okay, there. Now you go. Now put that in the, the thing. So don't make a lineup that anything's more than that. If you just did that, that's yeah, a massive. You're, you're better. You're better off than the lineups that you were making before. For sure, that's true. Yeah, I I actually, well, I have a confession to make. So, I was, in I was looking at uh, this rotor tracker graph. So I don't have rotor tracker. I'm too stubborn and I write my own software. So, <laughs> and I do. But you have to I admit do. that rotor tracker is really good. It is. It's a very slick product. I did. I did. I looked at the videos and it's it's. But I wrote a little script to go through all my results and. So, my top one percent. In MLB is not crazy high. It's 1.4 percent, but my top 0.1 percent is 0 0.17 percent. Right. So that's almost double. Right. Yeah. So it's another way of saying, I guess, I've been running pretty hot. 
Um, but, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I've been, uh, uh, unreasonably lucky. I mean, even in golf, I, I hit a single entry for a hundred K, uh, $200 single entry with a thousand nine hundred something players in it. Um, and you just played what you just played the top line of, based on your software. No, I just picked one at random from however <laughs> so, many thousands. It but generated. did you sim? But okay, but 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 Daniel, did you simulate that contest? Yes, I sim. I okay, 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 okay. That, that's the point that I was making because I like. Daniel. Don't tell me you put you took your one fifty set for your large field and you pick one random one for the small uh, field cut. Like that to me, that seems not that what you should be doing. No, I always simulate every contest individually. Okay, and then you just yeah. pick one at random. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. But at least that but, makes sense. That's fine. I thought I thought it was the other. I thought oh, oh, no, I'm no, just no, gonna no. pick one out of the 150 and just whatever. <laughs> right, that would be luck. That that would be unreasonably. Lucky. No, I was. I've been unreasonably lucky this year. I mean, people shouldn't take me too seriously. I had I had people like, IMing me. It's like they're like, "What do you do?" Like I always see you at the top of the leaderboard, and I'm like, you know, I'm kind of new. I wouldn't take me too seriously yet. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm plus EV, but I'm also pretty sure that i'm not 40 percent plus EV. <laughs> uh, is anyone though no probably maybe in nfl somebody is if you only play the softest contest gpps right the lower maybe, stakes yeah yeah i think that number could actually be possible in nfl just because there's so many just hopeless lineups in those contests i mean sometimes but, but, i generate them but <laughs> not, not that many <laughs> Yeah, but you not. share, but you share the qualities of I, I, what I would consider to be sharp players. That you're you're really good at what you do, and you have imposter syndrome, <laughs> right? Like it's just like like no, you actually are really good, but like like you don't and you, like it's not enough of a sample size. I, I could, this could have been better. This whatever, and then you just look and you go like no, compared to other people, just like that poker game, that thirty sixty game, you go like it's much easier to see people's mistakes clearly in a poker game that's the other thing like in dfs it's like like if you analogize dfs to poker imagine a poker game where everybody's dealt a hand with a hundred thousand cards <laughs> they throw a dollar in the pot they pick one card put it face down in front of them they all reveal it and then somebody has a flop a, a deck of cards that's going to be the flop with a million cards in it <laughs> picks one at random and turns it face up that's that's what a winner take all DFS contest is. Right, the I'm all in. All right, on the first card, I'm all in. Yeah, the the <laughs> cards are your lineups, and the flop is the fantasy results, right? But what a crazy freaking game that is! Like, uh, like in in limit hold'em, it's very easy to see exactly who is playing ten six off suit under the gun, and know that this player is losing a lot of money in the game. Right. But it, it, it's, it's harder to see. I think, I think for more casual players, it's harder to see what's going on because it's, there's so much data. Like, and most, like, most aren't even paying attention to the data. You look, look at no. the Reddit and Facebook conspiracy theories oh of, of all the late night and, and they like, changed it, the lineups and they could like, no, the guy hit a home run and he was like in 71st place and he just didn't see it. And that stack, the giants at the end of the slate came. Oh, they, and people have these. If you go on Facebook, some of these Facebook groups, the conspiracies I, get to the point of, like, like, I can't even come up. I mean, you can't even write them. One of, one of the best things I did for my own mental health uh, was deciding I was only going to look at Facebook once or twice a week <laughs> <laughs> uh, for about ten minutes, and it it just greatly improved my quality of life well i it's hate just, read it I, I mean i i get entertained oh, by it. reddit is the worst oh, i mean twitter i i mean you can feel the brain cells just leaking out of your head no but it, that, the, that's the fun that's the fun of it oh. <laughs> that's well, the fun I mean, you had you can't take it seriously yeah i guess that's i guess that's it you're missing but, out on all the fake boxing matches that aren't being scheduled together <laughs> against touts and stuff right i mean that's I, I don't enjoy watching people behave badly like like that kind of humor isn't as fun for me. Like cringe is hard for me too, you know. Like uh, I don't know. That's just me. But but you're but, you're old. But you're old school internet. You 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 go back. 
right? That's we're true. both we're both old school internet. I mean, what when's when's the first time that you remember being on on what anyone would consider to be the internet? Uh CompuServe. 1990. Okay. So I could even beat you out there. Uh huh. I was calling BBSs on my 300 baud uh -huh. modem on a Commodore 64. I do remember the 300 baud modem, and then I remember when we got a 1200 baud modem, and when that was a big upgrade. Right. I went from so the 300. Lines are just flying across the screen. Right. I got up to the 20, because after the Commodore 64, I, got a, I ended up with a 486 with a 2400 baud modem. Ah. Uh -huh. But, uh, yeah. but my parents had no idea what was the hell was going on. I'm about 10, 9, 10 years old, and I'm calling up. I'm looking for the wares, right? I'm looking for, I'm looking for the games, right? And then, oh, and then I, the upload-download ratio. It's like, oh, I need, to, I need to upload this 500K game that's going to take six hours to upload in order to now spend 18 hours to download this other thing. And just that's why they had to get a second phone line for me because they like, constantly they'd pick up the phone. <laughs> all the noises like what the hell are you doing down there because they didn't even understand how the modem worked they didn't even understand that they just knew that it occupied the phone line and it did whatever so i just got Probably away with whatever half the people listening to this don't even know what a modem is right right <laughs> <laughs> lastly <laughs> lastly I, I i have to i have to i have to ask you about this so you're into poker right computer programming computer software long time yeah classical singer yeah, so I went to school. Because, um, because obviously people will look and see nerdy tenor. Like, what, what, what does the tenor part mean? Yeah, so I, I still do that. I, I've been extremely fortunate. I went to school and got a double degree in uh, a computer science major and then a voice major at a conservatory, and I still do both of those things. So, um, I, that's not very common. Most people don't do exactly what they did in college but um yeah i uh i people are like oh you're an opera singer no i i don't do opera i do uh, a lot of solo work for oratorios and small ensembles um there's been times in my career where i've needed a break from software and i just do music for like a year and uh live off the money i made writing software i've done that a couple times but uh now I I kind of pick and choose. I I do maybe five or six professional gigs a year where I'll like sing with a group for a week and put on some concerts or do some recordings, that kind of thing. Um, but pandemic just destroyed all of this, of course. No, no Zoom. You didn't do any Zoom concerts or anything. <laughs> no Zoom. <laughs> It's really rough. I have a lot of colleagues for whom music is their principal source of income and is pretty brutal for them. A lot of them were asking me, hey, do you know any good programming schools or. Yeah, it's kind of grim. So what but would you things... consider to be what would you consider to be your regular job? I mean, do you just do it? Oh. Because obviously you're up at 11 in the morning Eastern watching my shows. I mean, you'd, you probably you don't have a nine to five regular job. Is it is it I mean, are you more like well, me, like. Anything to not have a real job. You just do all. You do three different things: DFS, software, singing, and anything so you could spend time with your family and not have to wear a suit. Yeah, I, that's that's pretty accurate. I mean, I, I I've been doing poker software, some of it public and some of it custom projects for various clients for a long time, and I got kind of burned out, and so I dialed down my hours of that, and so I've been doing the fantasy stuff like three quarter time for like a year, I'd say both the software and the just entering contests and things. Um, I don't know how much longer I'll do that, but, um, it's been going pretty well. So <laughs> you could become a DFS tout that sings their content. Oh, nice. Nice. You I could can do write, daily fantasy songs. I can write an accompanied recitative, uh, breaking down the slate for the day. You write a symphony, <laughs> right? You write a symphony. You talk about your niche content. Uh, how many subscribers do you think I could get for that? Because <laughs> yeah, people could listen. So, are, aren't you tired of boring hour-long podcasts of the plays? That, why you haven't? Here, here's the twenty tracks for tonight. First one is why the fuck is Odor in the optimal again? Da, 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 you know, like the, you could do something like that, right? Well, I mean, joke about. I think it's. It, I don't know if you'd agree, but it seems pretty typical for people who 
super successful in the gambling space to be good at something else. Like, I think like you have your whole performance experience and comedy stuff. And I, I certainly find that a lot in singing. Part of it's just out of necessity because it's just so hard to make a living singing. But like, if you're good enough to make money at a competitive game you're probably good enough to do other things too you know the most of most of as as uh, most people would say uh if you're good enough to make money at a competitive game you're more likely to make more money at something that is that else like like you know right. you know how if you if you have the skill set to beat poker or to beat dfs right. like you probably could be a, a stock trader you could probably be a, a, work at a hedge fund and blow them out of the i mean like Cause it's very similar. So people would say it's like, like there's so much more money to be made there. You could take the same skills, but I think that com the people that are more drawn to poker and DFS are the people that I think I, a lot are, and a lot have come from the finance space. And now we're yeah. in the poker and DFS space. And although you could make more money, maybe in the finance space, the culture and the lifestyle is not like, yeah. Like I don't, I don't, I, I want, I want the, I wake up in my pajamas and yell on YouTube lifestyle, not the, you go to an office in a tie and work for 12 hours, get a nice bonus and have, you know, millions of dollars in the bank. It's just that you you don't like that. The life sucks. Like you just, you don't want to be, you want to be on your own. Yeah, no, I agree. It's, it's funny to say being in gambling, but in a way, in a way, what you're saying is it's not about the money. <laughs> like, it is about the money, but it's about, like, if I can make enough money to live the life I have now and be home at 5 o'clock every day and see my wife and kid, like, that's huge for me. You know, I, I don't need to make all the money. Right. I mean, you heard but me say, I, if I can make fifty to $75,000 a year doing literally what I'm doing now, that's to me. That's the dream. That that that. What, what I don't see anything that's wrong. That, but there are plenty of people. Why are you pushing your edges? Why aren't you trying to make five hundred thousand? It's like, well, that will increase my risk of ruin. Can I? How do I get? How do I get to fifty to seventy five thousand dollars a year, in the least risky way possible, without having to, with in the most efficient way possible? Obviously, the most efficient way is to go there, beat you over the head, get your software, so I could just do it that way. That would be the most efficient. But what's the next most efficient? Uh, and and I, well, I, also, it's also just like I mean, I, I don't make every decision in my life trying to maximize my dollar EV. You know, I mean, <laughs> we're having this conversation. This this is uh, not helping my dollar EV. I'm doing no. it because I like to do it. And well, it's helping mine a little. <laughs> Good. I'm so glad I could help you. <laughs> right. Well, because it's it's marketing for the course and people. Oh, okay. I'm interested in that or something. But I mean, that's not the point of the show. The point. I like talking about. I like to talk to other sharper DFS players about their process, about their mentality, about sure. whatever, whatever. I just. Who else am I talking to? I. I, I, the, well, I don't talk to anyone. Like my poor wife, bless her heart, <laughs> has to listen to this crap, and she's like, okay. I can do two more minutes of this and then I'm well, done. What, is, what does she think? Like, you, cause so, you, you win money. What, I mean, what, I mean, it, I mean, obviously she must have some experience because of your poker playing. Yeah, that she, it's, that it's not that it's, it's not that dramatic of all. So you're telling me that you do this and then it comes like, like the whole, oh. like, you could lose money going to work thing is not a big deal to your wife because that comes from poker. That's part of it. I'm also just really lucky to have um, experience and credentials in an industry where I know if worse came to worse and I really needed to, I could get a job doing software somewhere and we'd be fine. It might be a shitty job, but we're not going to be out on the street, you know, with our house foreclosed, <laughs> you know, we'll be fine. So right, you're that, not going to lose your house in a GPP, right? No, I had I mean, to, I, I lost the house in the Thunderdome, buddy. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, the the worst case scenario financially for us is just not that bad, which which is an extremely lucky position to be in. I mean, I mean, anyone listening to this podcast is extremely lucky almost by definition. Like they have time to play daily fantasy sports. <laughs> like like or also you know, time to listen to a two and a half hour podcast. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you're do you're doing OK, I guess. So, yeah, she's been extremely uh, tolerant and she's a good game player, you know. Her family and my family are both similar in that 
you know, there's a family gathering, you sit down and like, hey, how are you doing? Nice to see you. Okay, what game are we playing? So, you know, she gets games. Uh, so, so you, she, are, you, she, are you are you are you are you more like me? I don't I, I don't know. I, I, maybe it's my personality. I can't play games recreationally with my wife and friends and stuff. Oh, I can, but it's because my wife and kid are both very smart and competitive at games. So we play, I don't know if you've ever played this game, Open Face Chinese Poker. So it's a mo game played for money. We don't play for money. We just play for points. But uh, it's it's a kind of a cross between poker and Jin Rumi, where you, you sort of lay out your cards and you develop a hand. And you get points based on how strong your hands are compared to other people. And, you're talking about uh, you're talking about five five two, right? Exactly five oh, five three. Okay, right five five three, whatever. whatever right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't. I never heard it called. Uh, typically, that's called Chinese. Typically, I just called it Chinese poker. And there's also uh, another version called Big Two, that's done uh, in a circle like that. The, the poker players would play these types of games, like Chinese poker. Yeah, open face. If you call it open face, yeah, I call it just Chinese poker. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 That, that. That's. They're right in there with me, man. And 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 they they're they're good game players. So. Yeah, but those are. Helps. But to me, those are simple games. So like, what uh, my wife plays games. Her friends play games. I don't really have many friends, but I the friends that I do have, they're game players. I mean, they they sellers of Catan. You know that anything. You know, but open tabletop. But the thing is, is that like, the stuff that I find fun is stuff that mm. other people don't find fun. Yeah. So like we'll go over we'll go over and and play like I could play the simple games that have I could never have seen them before but they have simple strategies that I don't have to think to do well at. We could, fine. Everyone's drinking, we're playing a, there's uh there'd be some game where it's more like Pictionary or anything like like okay. oh a word that sounds like this word and you have to put the words together. Okay, but the, the stuff where it's like there's a board, there are pieces to game and it's like like, dude, I don't have time to come up with a game theory optimal solution to this. <laughs> like, and then everyone is playing recreationally. It's like, but I, I look at this and my wife will go, why can't you just play for fun? And I go, but <laughs> it's like it, solving the problem is fun. If we're going to play and act as if there's not an optimal solution, why are we playing the game to begin with? So well, to me we... that like, and I know it's the, it's, it's the non normal person reaction, but like. When when people say when my wife says, "Oh, we got this new game. It's a card game." Like this, this what? Uh, what are these card? Munchkin Land? What? What? What are these? There's some oh, card yeah. game that oh, has all yeah. these unicorns in it, or so, I don't know what the fuck it is. But it's like, <laughs> but it's like Magic the Gathering practically, and it's like, dude, I never got into Magic the Gathering because you could you dive into that and you're gone for fucking five years of your life trying to figure that out with the with the the, the set combinations. I had a, I had friends that played competitively. Uh, so I, I understand the dynamics of the game, but that's what I, when I see that box, that's what I think of. And when, like, to me, fun is solving the problem. And if you're, and if everyone's goal, we're going to play six people here and we're just going to just act like, oh, I'm just going to move anywhere. Like, why don't we just sit around and drink then? Like, just like, what's the point of playing the game? And that, and everyone else is having fun. Oh, look, you killed me there. And this went there. And I put this on that. And oh, and then someone has to go to the bathroom. So, you know, you're waiting five minutes for the next turn. And I'm sitting there going, can someone go already? Come on, I want to put out this card. Or like, I, I can't deal with that. Right. I'd rather oh just be online and just do just like, do, 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 play with my online friends. Well, that's fair. I mean, my son is super into games. We probably have a thousand dollars worth of board games in the house of different kinds. So, but I, I don't have too much trouble with that because he's pretty smart and competitive so i i can play pretty hard and it, it's not an issue okay um, but that's if you find if you find someone that like i, I like if, if people want to join up and play like i i have a comic friend that in, invites me to play poker right? Uh -huh. right hey you play poker come and i i play over the course of the past what 14 years here in louisville i played that game like twice and they typically play a little tournament you know sit and go and of course, the two times that I went, I won both times because every, every, everyone there is horrible, of right? Course, yeah. uh, but it, it's for ten bucks. But back when when I was doing stand up comedy full time, like this is a social gather. I mean, I'm not playing for the ten. Like I know I'm not playing serious. I'm gonna, I'm dude. I'm not. I'm going to play seriously, but I know, also know I'm in a social situation now. Like since I'm out of the stand up space and the stand up, like I'm, why? Why am I? 
I'm not going to, uh, I know two people and I don't know seven others. And we're going to play a sit and go. That's going to last seven hours because no one, <laughs> right? Because the dealer and the, everyone passes it around. Like a lot, but most of the time I, since I trained to be a dealer, like I typically say just to speed things up, I'll just deal every hand. Right. right. I'll riff. Yeah. I'll, I'll do, I, cause you know, maybe, yeah, it's maybe 15 years since I dealt, dealt poker. Like I'm going to be much faster than you cutting cards and bending stuff. And it's, it, this is going to take forever. And it, to me, that's not fun to me. I'll, if I wanted to play poker, I'll just go to the, I'll just want to go to the casino card room and just, just play poker. Yeah. I've never had that come up. It would be awkward if, if, if people in my friend group, wanted to play poker and invited me i don't i don't know what i would say <laughs> say to that i'm like but wouldn't you get but wouldn't you get frustrated of like like you know what po- like you if you're gonna play poker let's play poker and i, I probably would focus on other things and drink a lot i'm guessing but <laughs> right but then you're not playing but then what's the point of the playing the poker part then it's like just nah. like, why even bother <laughs> i hear you <laughs> yeah i um it hasn't come up but yeah we'll see so nerdy tenor, people are gonna follow you on Twitter now. Oh, great! You have one. You, I believe you have. I believe you. you Did I tweet anything? No. No. Okay. But I knew it was you because you have the same, the same. I, I mean, it's unless someone's mm-hmm. posing as you, oh, the it, same uh, avatar. And I, I get that you have zero following, one follower. Who's your follower? Joshua Ryan Girding. Do you know that guy? No, but I think he might have tweeted that with a question or something. Oh, he might. He's like, do you have your own model or something? I, I see you winning a, a lot of the time or okay. something. And then he decided to follow you, even though you've never tweeted. <laughs> never tweeted. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll, I'll jump into the cesspool of Twitter. Just, 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 look, you follow, because you have to follow people also. You don't even follow me. Well, I just like, what I do is so dumb. I just like, occasionally when the mood strikes, I will search for somebody on Twitter, on Google, and then just read through some posts. Okay. <laughs> How do, where do you get the, so uh, because, you, uh, let me get this straight. Like, obviously <laughs> I use Twitter predominantly, obviously as a place for lulls and shit, whatever. And, you know, it's obviously to post stuff. Oh, I'm doing this, you know, Hey, you know, obviously cause I create content and stuff, but also to like, Oh, this guy's out and this guy's in, and this is the starting lineup and everything like that. You're, you're just getting that from a data source and it's just going in. Like you don't like, it's not, it's not imperative to you. That once the source that you're getting the roster information is updated, it's just updated in your in your software. Yeah, you don't you, know, you, don't, ha- you don't have to go through and go, oh my god, Paul George is out. Like, you, like, like, you don't. Yeah, like you're not gonna be able to utilize them that because if it's not in your data, it's it, it, it's you're you're not yeah. doing anything manually, so you, you'll still need I, it. I in do there. have to do some things manually because the internet being what it is, it breaks. So I do find myself in spots every once in a while where there's. A last minute change, but it's not going to be reflected in time. So I have to just get in there and muck about and do something, hopefully not too far. What's that? You put in a fake projection. Yeah, or something like that. You can't back test that. Uh Uh-oh. No. Uh -oh, can't back test that. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. Same thing with the weather in MLB. Like, when there's weather, I just have to look at Roth's uh, forecast and pick a probability out of my ass and plug it in there where there's like a 10% chance this game doesn't play and put that in my simulation. But do you, so, do you do what I do that in the cases where it's a significant enough threat that, that ownership starts going down, but to not pollute your other lineups, I, you only play the, the team at stacks. The software does that automatically. Oh, Very so it simple. learned to do that. Learn to do that. Yeah. <laughs> How did it learn to do that? Because because what all I do, I do something really simple, which is that I just give it some probability, and this is clearly wrong because it's different for pitchers and hitters. Oh, 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 because the projections start going down so low. Yeah, so there's some probability that the whole game puts up nothing but zeros. Right. And that's in the sims. And because that happens, the AI naturally, naturally does only in stacks a lot. Right, because if obviously, it, even if you were to, to decrease the projection by twenty percent, like all these individual hitters become horrible one-off candidates to begin with, and it, it only benefits you to play them when when one guy does well, the next guy does well, and then now their projection gets bumped up. So five of them in the lineup, you're still not going to get a lot of them when you you know put the rain chances of like twenty percent rain at PPD chances, 
but you're almost never, you're right. You ne- mathematically, you'd never get them as a one-off unless you purposely were to do that. But obviously in, uh, in most optimizers, you're not, you're not, you're not doing that. I mean, you could, you could do it. You could, I mean, you could do it in some regard by going to those players and just decreasing their projection by 20%. I mean, like manually. Right. A reasonable approximation, but what you don't get is what you were saying before, how like, like you only, it's similar to, I would imagine, well, you tell me, to rostering a really low projected one-off. Like, I think usually you'd rather just stack that team. Right. It's just the same principle, I think, right? Right. Well, that that's exactly the point, right? It, yeah. That, that was the whole vomit stack stuff from two years ago, which doesn't apply as much because th- too many cheap hitters that even the good teams have cheap hitters. Uh, the whole vomit stack perspective. And I mean, I do it in NFL, like NFL, it doesn't work anymore either. Cause now we have so many more high ceiling quarterbacks that the value of the vomit stack goes down. They're killing. If the pricing was different, maybe it wouldn't kill my vomit stacks. But the, the whole concept behind that was uh, the coral, the, the, the coral, the boost of a correlation helps the lower projected stacks more than the higher projected stacks, mm-hmm. right? Based on the ownership, because because you, you're now going to adjust based on ownership. So obviously the lower projected stacks are always are typically going to be low owned and the high projected stacks are going to be high owned. So those three levers, like, well, the ownership starting coming up on this, but to make up for the lack of projection, I need to pull up on both of the other two levers, which includes the correlation lever. Mm-hmm. Very for for it to be a, a a computer software person for me to describe things in terms of these. The, you picture I'm in this tractor with these, these <laughs> levers, like I'm making. <laughs> I'm going with the the big yellow thing, and this is how I'm building my lineups. And you're sitting there with an iPad, going done, right, and just walking away. And I'm like, I'm trying to build my lineups with this the big tractor and the big levers. <laughs> but it, it, that makes sense, right? Yeah, it does. It does. But I your AI, that, your AI already knows it. You, well, it figures it out. It figured it out before you even know it. Right. I'm sure it's doing stuff that's very clever that I don't know. I mean, that's all my work in computer poker stuff. Like, we've seen this again and again. And I, I'm not an expert, but I've read, I've read many accounts of serious professional poker players who's who've looked at solver output, and all the top pros do now, and there have been like conventional wisdom about things that have just been completely turned upside down. Uh, where, where, what, what, what would we get, give an example? What would be like the number uh, one thing? What would be the number one thing that I was doing in 2003 that was commonplace of this is, this is a typical thing that would be plus EV to do that solvers in 2021 have say are completely inaccurate. Okay. The one I was told, and I hope I'm getting this right. So you're in the small blind and somebody makes, let's say they make, they limp, okay? And then everyone folds to you in the small blind. So you've got a limper and it's you and the big blind left. It used to be people, and I think this is from No Limit, people would play very loose there on the theory that you're getting five to one odds on your money because you got... right. But it turns out the fact that you have to be two people and not just one means that you have to be quite a bit tighter than people used to think in that spot. And that's back what I would do in that spot. To, see, my my reaction would all depend on what the the, the properties of the limper and the properties. Sure. Obviously, but, I'm an exploitative talking, player. So I, this all goes out the window as soon as you think. Right. Because my natural player. reaction there in most games that I played would be to raise with almost any two cards. Uh uh-huh. right. Especially if if I if I know that I could knock out one of the two players with the raise, if not both, I know my frequency of how how often the the blind the big blind and the limper will fold. How often does that happen? How often does one stay in but not the other? I'm going to be out of position regardless. Uh it also uh, matters on the probability of them folding on the flop regardless of what comes out on the flop and what's in my hand. So like, to me, I'm weighing all of that. So like, I don't know what a solver would say, but as long as I'm at, if I'm at a weak tight table, sure, I, I yeah. raise with almost any hand that could stand uh, to win a showdown against one opponent 
if we stop playing right now. So like anything from like maybe like queen six upward or something, something like that. Right. Like, but, but if, I, if the limper, but if the limper is someone that's one of these like weak loot, like the loose, like someone that just plays every hand until the end, no matter what that I need to tighten. Like now I need to tighten up. Cause I'm going to basically rip. They could be limping with, with a hand that's higher in range from me. And I'm going to just, I'm not going to fire on the, and this is also the type of guy that's going to give me free cards, right? The fitter fold. So I could check if I miss and they'll check right behind me, not realizing they could pretty much steal the pot right here, no matter what they have. So like all that solver, that's why I, I look at all the solver stuff that comes, like I don't play, obviously I haven't played seriously or professionally since maybe 2009 ish, 2010, maybe. Uh, yeah. A lot of that stuff I read now and it's like, it, it, I, I I intellectually understand it, but like it doesn't, a lot of the stuff just doesn't apply to the type of game that I play. That's that right. it's like, like why? Oh, you do this 75% of the time. It's like, yeah, but I'm going to be playing against different people, different times. Like, like, I don't care what the solver says. I know right. this guy will fold on the flop if he doesn't hit it. So right. I'm just going to raise with any two cards, even though it says that my, my hand range is off for this. It's like, dude, the other guy is not playing GTO. I, I can right. just exploit that. And who gives a fuck? Right. I mean, this this is just taking us full circle to where you can win more being exploitive against somebody who's not balanced, right? I mean, and so why do, somebody, so 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 I'm tell me like why that. in the poker space it's very very similar to DFS. It, 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 this really comes all full full circle. The yeah. number one thing that I that I tell people in DFS, number one thing over all else is find the weakest opponents. That's like right. that that will be the biggest effect on your ROI than anything else, it right? Dominate. It dominates the equation for sure. And, it, and, and in poker, isn't that so many people are going with the, they're talking about solve, uh, doing all the solver stuff. It's like, I, to me, I, I know, I know some people, some people still that play poker from back in the day and they're still, they're, they're not doing any solver stuff that their, their skill is finding the good game. Like as long as you find the whales and the good games, they're playing in these private games in New York city and they're making tons of money. They're making tons of money. Well, I mean, I think, so there's two benefits. There's two reasons why you'd want to look at solvers. The first is if you want to play at the highest level you need to. But that's very rare. Very few people. The other is, it's still useful to look at because it shows you what a good baseline strategy looks like, right? It's good to know what the strategy looks like, even if you're not going to play it in practice. Because it will, it will sharpen your intuitions about if nothing else, about what your opponents are getting wrong. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I talk. I just have this Twitter account now. If I screwed up this poker example, I'm, and any tough poker players listening, I'm, I'm sure I'll get tweeted at. So I don't know if I got all the details right. But there's an analogy here for uh, uh, my software for MLB. Occasionally, will spit out in a big GPP. It will spit out a barely or unstacked lineup like a three one 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 lineup okay and there's two things to know about that the first is it could just be random noise and be crap the other is even if it's good the reason it's good is it's assuming that everyone else is playing the correct frequencies of stacks so even though three one there might be some profitable three one 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 ones in a vacuum against tough opponents because they're stacking 85% of the time in a real contest, that's, that they're doesn't not, no one, then the, the, the field is not stacking at 85% of the time. They're not close enough, right? So if you find one of those in my output, that's why it's in there. <laughs> I just didn't bother to filter it out. But the, Right, yeah. but that's, that's, that's similar to the, the example with, with the poker. Just like, yeah, like if exactly. the, tougher, the tougher opponents you're playing... You should be playing closer to GTO as possible, so you can't get exploited. But if right. you're playing and against nine, if you're playing on a nine-handed table, and eight of, your, eight of your opponents are playing nowhere near a balanced strategy, like playing balanced would be profitable, still. And you could just go into that situation and just let everyone else make improper frequencies. Yeah. Or you I mean, could try to make three times the amount of money by just exploiting all, the, all of them. Well, I mean, I adjust at the table. This came up the last time I played Limit Hold'em. Actually, two times ago. The game was about to break, and we were down to three-handed. And it was me 
and another very competent player and kind of a not very good player. And I got heads up with the competent player and it was, I had the initiative. Um, I raised before the flop and he called and it went bet call on the flop, check, check on the turn. And on the river, it was an ace high board and I had king high. And I bet my king high for value Mm -hmm. because I know I had a competent opponent who would know that sometimes he needs to call with worse. And he called me with queen high. Right. That was my best guess at GTO for the hand. If I were playing against the other guy, I would never bet the king. Of course not. Right. Never. Because he never calls with a weaker hand. But, but this, when I'm, I'm, well, I mean, if you, it's one of those situations uh, that I, a lot of people got wrong. I mean, get wrong even back in the day of uh, it, it in the two plus two books. It always, when you have the best hand, when call like that, when called, like, oh, it's like, geez. if you have, you see so many people that bet the best hand, that's, if everyone was face up, you would have the best hand. But if anyone calls you, you don't like, like you have yeah. to realize that someone has to call you with a worse hand. So some people, what they would do in your spot is bet King high as a bluff. Right. Right. And then go, I, and hope that the guy with the bottom pair folds. Right. But because he's comp, but because you're, co- they're both competent. You're now in the third level where you look at the betting pattern going, well, if your opponent had any of this piece of this, the turn wouldn't have gone check, check. Right. And your bet at right. the end, maybe based on the size, so- based on the size of the pot, and what you're getting, he's going to call enough of the time with queen high because yeah. a, 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 a more timid player would check because you actually are in a worse spot if you check and he bets. Right. It's hard to call with your hand after yeah. that sequence of events and then he ends up stealing the pot. It's almost better because he can't, I mean, it would take the balls for him to raise in that spot and then you to call with king high so that 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 progression likely if you're in that if you're in that progression find so whoever has the mirror behind you like right. you, or you never you're like that's someone that after that hand is done you say thank you very much but I will never be playing you ever again right because right. it wouldn't <laughs> be worth it but those right. to, to me to me what, what you're explaining what these progressions like this like to me that's the fun part like that mm-hmm. that is the that was the fun of poker and to me that's the fun of DFS of it this guy does this and this guy and then and then this and this and what would be if I did this and then did this what which would be the most profitable I view right. that the same as playing lineups and contests in DFS. Well, it's interesting psychologically for me they're they're different. Like I I do enjoy that in poker and in fact after the hand he's a very nice dude and he's like oh good bet and I was like. I was like, I told him, I'm like, my bet was a sign of respect, <laughs> which he understood. Right. But I only bet it because I respected him as a good player. Right. Like, I'm never doing that. But yeah, but I love that stuff too. But for me, DFS, it's much more like the satisfaction for me is like, wow, is my software really good <laughs> enough to win? Like, can I make it good enough to win? Well, because you're coming from the software background more than the poker background, though. That's right. Yeah. I mean... With poker, I use my own software and other people's software to try and understand these spots. And and I've spent a lot of time training with solvers and stuff. But one guy in a game I was talking to about this, he's like, yeah, but most of your money is not from that. It's from exploiting the bad players, which is, of course, true. Um, it's more for me, the the poker GTO study is, is more for the fun of it, which is a little twisted, I guess. But also it's it's defense against good players. Um, and so if I'm heads up with somebody competent, I know how to mix up my play so that they can't get the better of me. Right. And uh, I, and I view it from the perspective of, I'm just not, I, I'm going to find the games where those, with, where yeah, the players are weaker. Games. Right. I'm just but like, I, that's my natural have, inclination of just, I don't I care how have I have money. to win. Just, but just let, let me make the money. Like, but I, but I also, I don't weigh, I think a lot of people in poker, I mean, at least back when I was playing in live poker, way too much of the sharp players versus the weak players. Like yeah. there, there are so many people, cause I ran games. I ran games in New York city. Uh, uh. 
and a lot of sh like players would be like sharp sharp players would be like I don't want to play in this game. There's too many good players in it. Yeah, no, but there's we, I, are there two really bad players in it? Yeah, yeah. then you should, don't wait by the number of sharp players. And that's what and that's what people get in DFS when I explain like like that 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 on every episode it seems like my conundrum of like I think I still have a positive edge in the higher stakes contests that are more single entry three max, but have a lot more of the sharper players in it. But this other contest has what are the weaker players? Like I, what I should be, not, I should be weighing what I enter based on where the bad players are, not caring about where the sharp players are. Cause, cause sharp players, are, well in this contest, they're entering the 150 maxers take up 30%, 35% of the entry fees. Yeah. The entries in the contest. I go, yeah, but how about the other 65%? I mean, like, right. like I don't care. I don't care that in an MMA, in a showdown, that we 50% of the lineups are are very sharp by sharp players. Yeah. But the other 50%, like, but I go to the high stakes stuff and I go, okay, how, ma how many players here would I consider sharp? 90%. Like, how much money can I, like, how much money in poker, you can, there's, there, someone could lose enough that everyone can eat, but yeah, right in poker. But I don't think that that applies in DFS. No, if you do the math, I've done. I I had to do a reality check uh, in small in tiny four man golf contests. I was experimenting with these, and they're like two hundred seventy five dollar entries, right? And so a few things were obvious to me at first. Obviously, if there's three good players, I'm not going to sit, but the math is just not very good. Like if if I see a table and there's one fish, one bad player or one unknown player and Osimo and McLove, do I want to take the fourth seat? Well, if you assume that me and Osimo and McLove and all of the same EV, the same quality lineups, which I'm sure I don't, but let's just pretend we're all equally skilled, that fourth player for us to break even he needs to lose his rake plus all of our rake. Right. So if there's a 6% rake, he needs to be losing 24% or more on average just for us to break even. And I just didn't see evidence that anybody was that bad. But you and could so do that I, in three mans, though. Uh-huh. Right, three yeah, mans, I mean, that works because you, you don't have to... Right, the, yeah. the rake doesn't take up as much, right? As much. Yeah, I guess so. But I, I just like I can't see anybody being that bad, and so I don't. I didn't. Pl I stopped playing those. <laughs> like the math doesn't work. Um, Unless there are people that are that bad. I mean, I think it's pretty hard to be that bad in golf. You know. I, have you, you seen you, some lineups? I mean, maybe I mean. But not, I don't not, know. In the GPPs, yes, you do. Yeah, but not. Some. You're talking about at the two hundred and seventy-five dollars. Yeah. If you just if you just spent all of your salary or most of it, you're probably good. Anyway, you're probably you're certainly not losing twenty four percent, right? Right. So if a if a strategy that stupid isn't enough to for the others to win, then what are we? You know what I'm saying? What are right. we doing here? Yeah. Yeah, but in the large so, GPPs, that's not that's what that's right. why it always attracts me. It's like like I I know it, it's it's the the realizing your edge in these contests is yeah frustrating but i mean like it's that's where all the bad players are i mean like it's uh, just like it's so obvious it is obvious yeah. but but the, the the reconciliation that i need to have is that when i play the smaller field higher stakes contests it's so much easier to exploit like like uh, it, it's that cognitive distance in my head of like and that's where that contrarian like people, pe like on on the DFS pregame show, I when people ask oh, yeah. me about single entry contests, and I go, no, I play more contrarian in single entry than I do in large field, and they it's like, but in large field, you're trying to get nuts, so you get the number, so yeah, yeah, but the ownership is actually more efficient in the large field than it is in the single entry, because so yes. many people are playing cash type lineups. Because yes, you're right, you don't need that much leverage to win a 300 person, 400 person contest. But it's so much easier to exploit. So like, yeah. so now I look at that and I go, now I'm trying to do this hybrid thing of like, I play large field, I play small field, and 
the mindset of even building the two lineups. It's almost like I I need I have to delineate my time in my mind of like okay before an MLB slate from six to six thirty before lock at seven or whatever that's my single entry three mm-hmm. max type of thing. I'm just thinking totally in terms of that. So it's like who's the oh seventy percent on pitcher? I'm playing three batters against that guy. Okay, I'm playing depending on the size of the slate and then. Then I go at 6.30 and go, okay, I'm going to build my 150. And it's like, like maybe I don't have Fernando Tatis. I play three single entry lineups. And I have no, I have no Fernando Tatis. And I'm fading because he's not going to be 29% owned in that. He's going to be 42% owned in that. And that's like absurd. And yeah, then I go just... to the then I go to the large field stuff. And it's like, okay, if I end up with 22% Tatis, then that's just that's what ends up happening. I, I need to look at it again. But I've, I've usually been playing the... Ball four, which is the two hundred fifty yeah. format, and uh, I mean, I think yeah, we looked at it on your pregame show. It was a night slate with three games, and the stack I had, which won, had some, like six percent ownership or something. Right, and there's only six teams on the slate. Six teams, and I don't know. I'm sure my software is not perfect, but I'm pretty sure that six percent is wrong. You know, and so that's really surprising to me that, I mean, I'm I'm guessing that it's not so much that the constructions are that bad in those. It's just the ownership that's bad. Right. Right. It's all the ownership is the lever. Right. And, and it's, it's a byproduct of probably the laziness of sharper players that are playing at high volume. I mean, Eric says, I mean, that's what he talks about on this, this podcast when, when when it's on. Right, he goes. I want to play against the guys that are that are just jamming in their cash lineup, that are just putting in their top one or two projected lineups from their 150 set. To just that the ownership becomes so inefficient that, like, I'm just going to exploit that and don't have to worry about like computing and simulating or anything because it's obviously it's. I mean, when you when you when you have when you have uh, uh, running backs. That are you know that seventy eight percent owned, like why, like just don't play that guy. Just like, yeah, and if he bur- and if it burns you, it burns you. Whatever. Like like that. Like to me, it's easier to do that in the in the small field stuff. So that's the, but you have to think two different. Like you have to think two different ways. So it's hard, and maybe maybe this is the reason for that. Someone like you that plays a more balanced strategy, with software. Like. You said you're simulating the smaller field contests. Yeah. But based on based on the ownership, like are 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 what lineups are you getting to? Are you getting to contrarian lineups like I get to? Or yeah. are you are you putting in lineups that are more closer? Like what is it that you're doing differently to get the contrarian lineup that the other sharper players that also have their own models and stuff? Is it just that you're simulating that specific contest and maybe they're not? And they're just going, we're simulating the, they're simulating the big field and just picking one of the, like this thing that I, I made fun of you before of like, you would obviously in golf, not just pick a random lineup and throw it in. And that's getting ridiculously lucky. Do you think that, that sharper players are, are still doing that? And because of the volume, they're still, they're still profitable. It's just that, you know, it, they don't have to get as granular to make sure that their game theory optimal in every single contest, because it just isn't worth the time for them to do it. I'm I'm speculating because I've never talked to any of them, but I think that's a good guess. I I think it's it's quite possible that like I have no idea what other people are doing, and I don't know how many of them are doing are trying to compute an equilibrium strategy and using that, or as opposed to like doing something more similar to Slate IQ and computing odds of various stacks having a ton of points and then playing that percentage, which is very similar, but not exactly the same. Um, I don't know how many people simulate each contest individually, which I do. Can Um, can you get your AI software to, to, to learn that? Yeah, no, I mean, one of like, like, can you download the CSVs and say, I'm going to study the the cults as lineups. Can you, can you create a piece of software that goes through and kind of like try to recreate his like process and like how to, over the scope of these hundred slates, what process would one person have to generate these lineups and then see like 
what's more pro- like oh they're 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 all this they're all they must be doing something that like they're hard, they they must be deciding on specific like you, there are some times where I have all five one 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 stacks or all five three because I ran out of time and I just clicked the button so I made sure I get a bunch of lineups like you're so an AI piece of software an algorithm would be able to, to spot something things like that like would would you able to be, be able to create that type of software to st- analyze single users play styles and build like build the software build have the ai build you the software that would have came up with those 150 lineups that sounds like a challenging research project but uh in in my copious free time i could (laughs) uh sounds interesting yeah i have looked at what other people do but but not a ton um it's something i should do that's all uh, i do yeah, I know. I mean, <laughs> that's why it's so up. weird for me to like. That's literally all I do. That all I, I care know. about is what everyone else is doing. I don't. Don't. Uh, no one should care what I do because I. I I'm doing I just, something based on what everyone else is doing. I just look at what my software is doing. And right. So you know, right. We both are blind. We're both are just like no one. Neither me and you <laughs> are not doing anything ourselves. Right. Exactly. You're letting your little your little uh, sky. You're letting Skynet take control. <laughs> And to yeah. me, I'm just I'm waiting for Skynet to take control and then saying, how do I exploit Skynet? Nice, nice. Well, I'm my phone is finally running out of power. We've achieved uh, we've achieved that. But this is this the longest you've ever talked about DFS to another human being before, live in person? Or yes, I think the closest would be when I bored the ear off of some poor poker player I was sitting next to, <laughs> uh, who made the mistake of showing a little bit of interest, and that that's all it took. Right, you know, that's all it the, takes for me also. I think we're, <laughs> we're the same type of people. At Nerdy Tenor on Twitter. Yeah. Follow, we'll follow get, get him more than one follower, and he's going to start following people. He's going right, to start posting right. memes, and he's going to start challenging people to boxing matches, like you should be doing <laughs> on DFS right. Twitter. Right? If yeah. you're not challenging people to boxing matches, I don't know what you're doing in the DFS industry. <laughs> all right. And then uh, uh, you can pick up, as always, the Theory of Daily Fantasy Sports, 15-hour audio DFS masterclass at theoryofdfs.com.